तो स्टार्ट करिए राकेश सर गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स सो आफ्टर सिक्स लॉन्ग सेशंस हैविंग ऑल द कंट्रोवर्सीज ऑल द डेवलपमेंट्स ऑल द इश्यूज दैट वी आर फेसिंग we are now come to a stage where we need to look from the industry perspective as to what are their expectations at the end of the day when you look from industry all your clients will ask ki bhai karna kya hai aur kaise karna hai and that's exactly what is this session we have three panelists from the industry itself and we have a moderator from our uh, consulting faculty uh, consulting side so let's let's have those questions primarily how do we manage this risk and what are the planning avenues that can be offered uh, essentially to all our clients so let me start with the three panelists first and then come to our moderator uh, our first panelist is uh, vijeshri r uh, she is the taxation group head at vfs global uh, while she is looking young but she has 22 plus years of experience in international tax and regulatory matters Uh, she has been speaker at international forums and has contributed articles in leading journals she has received emerging leader of the year award she has received cfo special award she has also received a direct tax leader of the year award so here is a award winning personality with us welcome vijeshri to this session our next uh, speaker is uh, ca prashant gandhi he also carries a 20 plus years of experience right from finance direct and indirect tax with large mnc's uh ca prashant is the tax head at atlas copco and over and above that he is also looking at policy matters both on indirect tax as well as direct tax prior to atlas copco he has worked with other big mnc's like comins india as well as kaigi engineering so we have a person who has a global perspective of how things happen and has seen uh you know how foreigners ask questions to indian mnc's or mnc's with the indian subsidiaries so warm welcome to you prashant and the third speaker that we have he is trying to connect but will have it soon uh, i think he has joined uh, ca rakesh gupta ji welcome sir uh, so mr vip gupta is uh, vp and group tax head of at the uh, rpg house he is a chartered accountant and company secretary with 25 years of experience he has worked in several industries right from you name it manufacturing financial services retail information technology real estate he has expertise in direct tax and international tax as well as indirect tax prior to rpg group he has worked for two decades with aditya birla group and lodha and lodha developers uh, welcome ca rakesh ji uh as well as uh, uh you know all the panelists uh, to this particular session now coming to the moderator uh, ca he is known as ca gupta uh, chandra has gupta is his name so ca ca gupta uh i think uh, for his introduction one single line is good enough he has been recognized as the leading tax controversy leader in india leading tax controversy leader in india consequently for last 5 years by international tax review what can be a better introduction than this but just to add to couple of things he has 30 plus years of experience his activities in tax field are right from advisory to compliance to controversy he has advised indian as well as global mncs on several structuring projects he is a fellow member of uh, our ca institute and also a bachelor of law uh, uh you know from mumbai university he has been an eminent speaker both in india across uh, as well as uh, on several business from forums in india as well out, as outside so welcome ca gupta sir uh, for uh, you know accepting uh, uh this uh, you know invitation for being the moderator of this important panel discussion uh, the floor is all yours uh, gupta ji sir thank you rakesh for that uh... an introduction and a very warm welcome to all the participants and a special welcome to the panel members on this uh, wonderful sunday morning uh, it is always a pleasure and uh, to speak at institutes forum and i will say particularly on this day as we celebrate uh, 133rd birth anniversary of dr s radhakrishnan who was the second president and the first vice president of india and we all know his birthday celebrated as the teachers day 
and uh, the and our institute is obviously <clears throat> a teacher in that sense for us and therefore what better day to have this session uh, and so it's an honor and privilege to be there to be here uh, what we plan to do uh, is in the next 75 minutes or so, we will uh, uh, have a discussion between the panel members and myself. And uh, towards the end of the last 10 minutes, we will have the session open for uh, questions and comments from the participants. Uh, with that, uh, moving to the topic of the day, which is managing tax risk, planning for the road ahead. And I think the topic could not have been more apt uh, in the current situation that we are in. Uh, for the reason that we all know, we live in a VUCA world, a world that is, I would say, surrounded by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And if at all there have been any changes, the VUCA world has only become more acute and perhaps virtual, virtual over the last uh, a couple of years. And tax is certainly not an exception to this rule. Uh, and if you were to see the tax landscape, over the last decades or so, we will see what changes have happened in the tax landscape, not only in India, but across the world. To begin with, if you were to see the 2012, where we had the first amendment or the retrospective amendment on the indirect transfer rules, as well as the amendment relating to the royalty and FTS, which was also retrospective basis. Then coming to 2013, we had the GAR being introduced. Of course, the, the, the GAR provisions were deferred until 17, 18 financial year, but it was the first time GAR was introduced. And we know in the session yesterday where Mr. Anish Thakur took us through the substance over form rule and the background on the introduction of GAR. And then we, had, we also had the draft web section plan report being shared in that year. Then from 2015 to 2017, we had a few more changes. The place of equity management test being introduced in the domestic tax rules, which largely impacted Indian subsidiaries uh, or subsidiaries of Indian joint of Indian headquartered companies and joint ventures, uh, so to say, which were controlled from India. We have the final web section plan report being released. Equalization 1.0, where we got uh, uh, the first time introduction of, uh, so to say, a, a digital tax. And then significant amendments on the Mauritius and Singapore DTA, which happened during that period. Then moving to 2019, where we had the uh, Indian government uh, notify the, the multilateral instruments, depositing that with the, uh, with, the, with the authorities. And the first test of the MLI being effective from 1st October 2019. And MLI, as we know, has significantly changed the way we read the tax treaties. It is not only the plain text of the treaties as it is. One has to side by side also look at the MLI. And more importantly, maybe the preamble, the minimum standards on LOBs, the principal purpose test, and so on. Then coming to 2020, we had, apart from the change in the dividend taxation, abolishing of the whole system of DDT, moving to the classical system of dividend taxation, we had the first significant real taste of digital tax, I would say with the introduction of a significant economic presence and the equalization levy. And perhaps India was the, I was pioneer in that sense to implement that and take real steps from a web section perspective. And lastly, coming to 21, 2021, we have come back to a full circle where we have now the government introducing amendments relating to the indirect transfer to clarify that those does not apply to transactions uh, prior to 20th May 2012. And finally, we also have the, a good consensus on the blueprint of pillar one and pillar two approach. And as Rakesh mentioned, I think it is important for us to see how will, what is the industry's reaction to this and how are they managing the taxes? And obviously, I think it is important for us to look at that. And with that broad overview, let me move to our panel to get their thoughts on what changes have happened in the last decade. And I will, mentioned that I don't think we could have called for a better panel. We have a diverse and a significant uh, panel with significant experience in international taxation. And I think it will be good to get their perspectives on how they manage the risk from an organizational perspective. But we also need to be mindful that a topic like managing tax risk can be quite overwhelming because it covers a broad spectrum from compliance, litigation, planning, and so on. 
And therefore, in order to have a more focused discussion, what we thought will be good is to have divide that into segments. And we have divided this into three segments, starting with compliance, moving on to litigation, and then looked at various other developments, both India and outside India, and how will an organization react to these changes and manage this risk. With that, let me first turn to Vijayashri. Vijayashri, I know we have seen a gamut of tax compliances being introduced in India. And we have, of course, the filing of tax returns, withholding obligations, the recent introduction of 194A, 194Q, uh, obtaining 15 CACP for remittances, uh, tax audit reports, transfer pricing compliances, uh, and assessments, litigation, and so on. And somebody from an organization who looks at not only all this change, all these compliances in India, but also outside India. What is your take and how does an organization manage all these compliances uh, and the risk associated with that? Thank you, CAG, and thank you, a special thank you to WRC to give this opportunity uh, to speak at uh, such a wonderful uh, seminar. So, uh, 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 in terms of your question, yes, I mean, uh, we have to, as an organization, be vigilant enough to kind of track all these compliances that is getting more and more complex each day and definitely the administrative burden around it. Uh, so, uh, from the group, as a group head uh, of tax, I mean, from our perspective, it is very important, at least as a tax head, to understand that we need to build those processes and SOPs within an organization for an effective governance around the compliances. So, each day we have to proactively think forward and, okay, what is the upcoming uh, compliance that is coming up or how do we build those SOPs within an organization for an effective compliance? And uh, what we do as an organization is also uh, ensure that our level of risks are assessed carefully. Now, whenever we are looking at any positions that we take or uh, around those compliances, or, or, or if it is if the situation is reasonably unclear or uncertain, then we ensure that we seek those professional advice and we have those uh, consultant's opinion along with evidences as a backup for evidences. Now, we also ensure as a group that whatever arrangement we structure from a tax side is backed up with a commercial rationale. And that that is one of the key things that I've seen across the globe. One common message is commercial rationality to any structuring uh, that we do. Yes, you're right that there are host of compliances that are uh, kind of, uh, that we see, uh, I mean, every day in terms of plugging all those uh, kind of loose ends at all levels. So one one advantage that we need to see as tax heads is using automated technology, like using technology as a central monitoring tool to kind of monitor or track the compliances that are happening across the globe. This is one thing that we do as an organization. We track that centrally. Um, uh, and also technology used for, say, so say certain uh, for easy and accurate implementation of tax reforms wherever possible, like say, for example, e-invoicing in a particular country, like India introduced e-invoicing, then there is e-invoicing in Saudi or Egypt. Uh, likewise, there are uh, DAC 6 regulations in the EU. So wherever possible, and, and yes, of course, the GST in India. Now, wherever possible, the use of automated technology is, is kind of advisable and that the roadmap towards that would make the process more efficient. And as a tax head also, from a governance standpoint, it becomes very much comfortable for us to uh, kind of uh, uh, run that function effectively. Also, uh, internal tools to map the tax risks and the controls around the processes, geographies, business, like say having a third party management tool, like any third party engagements are reviewed and approved from a tax perspective. Like having those SOPs and governance processes uh, within the organization is a must today uh, when we see so many compliances and increased complexity around that. Thanks, thanks, Vijayshri. Maybe, Prashad, if I turn back to you uh, and get your perspective on the gamut of these compliances and how do you manage that? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, uh, thanks, CAG, and uh, thanks to WIRC for giving this opportunity. Uh, but then I totally agree with uh, Ms. Vijayshri, what she has mentioned that uh, we have to see how we adapt the changes uh, which is and the developments which are coming up on a day-to-day -day basis and also uh, how we adapt it in the processes of the organization uh, in a way of automation uh, setting up the processes reviewing of the agreements etc 
so we see that uh, that is how we should proceed within the organization so i think possibly uh, laying down sops uh, uh, commercial rationale and automation perhaps as uh, vijesh and prashant said rakesh if i can bring you into the picture in the context of payments to non residents now there is always this challenge between uh, uh, taxability what is the if we, even if an income is not taxable but you have on the other side the risk of disallowance under section uh, 40a uh, and this applies both to more more i would say it applies to group company payments where you have to balance uh, in that sense and of course to other payments as well so how does an organization balance in the context of this payments to non residents the charge of taxability versus disallowance and and of course this will become more acute for come something like software where now we have the supreme court ruling that the payment is not taxable but perhaps the industry may still have this apprehension of what view the authorities may take and they want to be protective or around the disallowance under 40 and so on uh what is uh, how do you think that the industry reacts to that rakesh ji yeah yeah yes yeah. so thank you cag and thank you wrc to uh, to give this opportunity to speak to the uh, uh, in this session so uh, cg as we talk about payment to non resident actually okay the see that uh, day by day things are becoming complicated actually okay from the payer side it will be always endeavor that uh, that best position is taken which is uh, uh, which is uh, which mitigate my risk also as well as uh, wherever possible the cost is also uh, uh, kept in under control because as you know means like uh, in india mostly most in my entire career i've seen that most in most of the cases for some or other reasons uh, uh, we are always on the receiving end and in in most of the time uh, non resident service providers uh, uh, they are not willing to bear any tax so if the tax is to be paid tax is always mostly it is on the on the payer uh, uh, payer responsible and, and uh, further that you have a risk of 163 and uh, and uh, whatever the uh, uh, position which department is taking for uh, for so coming to that means like payment to uh, whether it is related party or whether it is non related party you know, complications are there in both the scenario we have to be we have to uh, assess our position very carefully whether tax is applicable not applicable whether tt provisions is uh, tt benefits to be given not to be given there are there are parties who are willing to give the trc there are parties who are not willing to give the trcs there are parties who are willing to give the trc but not in fashion what we want actually now on top of that you have a uh, ghost of the mli provisions and now lot of lot of decision which has come for the for the mfn clause make available so there are lots of nuances on non resident payment and each and every payment has to be closely and very very uh, carefully looked at actually okay sometime when uh, so on a practical aspect whenever you see that uh, tax is uh, if tax is borne or tax is on account of the non resident generally we will go very conservative actually okay we will deduct the tax and let uh, let the other party claim the credit but wherever the tax is is to be borne by the by the payer actually okay then that uh, uh, cost aspect also come grossing up and all those kind of thing so means uh, for each payment to payment uh, uh, we'll have to we'll have to uh, take a very 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 careful position on that and uh, simultaneously we are uh, generally uh, uh, we uh, we uh, <coughs> take the professional opinions also wherever the uh, wherever that uh, situation is dicey okay and uh, that's how means uh, generally all these uh, non resident payment has to be dealt with sure. but your rights uh, you are right to say whenever this payment is to made to related party actually okay uh, situation become more uh, 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 more challenging sure. so because uh, as means like you have to also ensure that uh, related party is not affected or ultimately uh, Uh, in the overall scenario, <coughs> uh, in the transaction cost doesn't go up. Sure, sure. And linked to that, of course, will be the issue on tax return. I will come to that a bit uh, later. But uh, 
Uh, Prashant, wanted to get your insights. I know you also as a group have a lot of payments to group companies. So your perspective on that? Yeah, surely, uh, CAG. Uh, we also look into various compliance in terms of documentation. And we are very conservative while making payment. Normally, we withhold tax. And we see that our counterparts are not affected in terms of cost. They should be able to get credit. Uh, and if they are not able to get credit, then we see how we can minimize the cost. So commercial rationalism is, of course, an objective and compliance, secondly, uh, in terms of. But uh, we also see that our risk is minimum in terms of uh, 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 compliance of these uh, foreign payments. Especially now, uh, um, MLI is brought into along with the treaty, and we'll have to dwell into each and every quest uh, where the synthesized tax is uh, having any other uh, uh, any other provisions. Visa is specifically from uh, PE perspectives or the number of days uh, the person is outside India and all that. I'll continue with uh, Prashant with you on this filing of the return. Now we know that. Recently, in, in the amendment which have been made, there is an exemption to a foreign company from filing a return. But whether a transfer pricing report is required to be filed or not, that clarity is not. Then, of course, the consequence of not filing as well. And we've also seen some apprehension from overseas uh, uh, companies who want, don't want to file a return. And they have even higher, uh, they're even fine with uh, Indian companies withholding tax even at a high rate, even though the payment may not be taxable. And to the extent that they don't want to even claim a refund, uh, because as you know, the mechanism of claiming a refund itself is also a challenge. If they don't have a bank account in India, then working, working with a bank, uh, opening a virtual bank account and so on. So again, a host of challenges surrounding the filing of a return as well. So what has been your experience in, in this context of uh, foreign companies filing tax returns? Yes, CG. So normally we deal with our associate enterprises and... Uh they probably act based on our recommendation. If we say that we need to file return of income in India and that will be a better compliance in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, if there are any refunds, then we can claim that in the return of income and there can be better positions which can be taken off and which probably could not have been taken at the time of withholding while making them payment. So they agree uh, normally. And uh, if at all they don't agree, then we do do the compliance uh, in a conservative way and uh, normally uh, withholding tax as per the treaty rate. That is one. Secondly, uh, as you rightly mentioned that there is an exemption given to uh, companies, uh, foreign companies uh, for uh, royalty, FTS, uh, etc. But then uh, similar clarification is not given in uh, uh, transfer pricing, filing of transfer pricing report. So we are not very clear whether exemption is available for filing of transfer pricing report. So better to file the transfer pricing report and then better to file the return also. That will be better compliance. So from tax risk perspective, it is better to be compliant, file the return and take certain positions also in the return of income. Sure. Yeah. Rakeji, coming to you, you mentioned on this tax gross up. So how does that factor in the decision making? So do you ensure the foreign companies file return or you leave it to them to decide and how does that uh, work? No, so CAG again means like when we are when we are uh, dealing with the uh, with our uh, non-resident service providers. So there are two two three categories which you can uh, say that there are there are associate enterprise means like when you are making the payment to your uh, subsidiary or your group companies or your uh, uh, your holding company like that. Then there are there are service providers who are very regular in your. Uh, uh, regular transaction with the company and there are uh, uh, other kind of uh, service providers who are not very uh, very very frequent uh, uh, there are not not very frequent transaction or there may be one off transaction over a period of time so so fundamentally means like uh, wherever this group companies payments are there definitely will have to have a com take a uh, complete uh, uh, complete position on that whether the uh, when the payments are made whether group companies required to file the return what are the compliance they will have to make in india if that uh, uh, tax is to be claimed back by the group company how that uh, uh, how that refund can be claimed so there they're uh, dealing with maybe in different manner wherever that uh, wherever the payments are made to a very frequent uh, uh, service providers 
okay generally we are aware that they are they are having offices in india they are thing they are also filing their tax returns in india okay so generally we will ask them to and we try to convince them that uh, uh, you will get credit in your own countries or uh, uh, or even if you can file the return and you can claim the refund so there we insist them to uh, so bear the tax and not to be so there is no grossing up also okay so it's not only grossing up this entire this entire tedious grossing up is only on tax on tax but what about the major issue is the tax itself okay. so grossing up will increase your cost by 1% 2% but tax itself may be 10 15% okay sure. so so that's a means like case to case basis uh, uh, call has to be taken seriously okay and uh, sometime uh, whenever there is a large payment and there is a uh, uh, tax team is uh, uh, become part and parcel of that uh, uh, negotiation or discussion with the with the uh, with the service providers how do we structure the transaction so that it's a win win situation for both the parties so generally either we insist that tax is to be borne by them they can claim the credit or we we uh, put a clause in the agreement that uh, uh, that tax will be borne by us. We will issue the uh, issue the TDS certificate. Either they will file and claim the refund, or they will file uh, uh, credit in their home country. And whenever the credit is available, that money should be refunded back to uh, back to us. So all there is no thumb rule. We say on case to case basis, uh, uh, decision has to be taken. Sure, but that's a very interesting perspective of having the agreement, the requirement for them to to file a return if that can be done. So and and I tell you, means like in uh, in many cases we have been able to uh, get back those money also. So when the non-resident are not willing to accept that position, that will will not uh, bear the tax. So at least we ensure that uh, we insist them to accept that uh, uh, you will claim the credit and the and once the credit is allowed, that money should be refunded back to us. Great. That, that's a very good, good, good perspective. Uh, so moving on to the last segment on the compliance side, Rakesh ji, uh, we have this new process on the faceless assessments uh, now moving to faceless appeals and faceless penalties are also likely to happen. And, and the worry is that are we looking at a regime where we'll also have a faceless ITAT, uh, which is currently, of course, uh, virtual. And the apprehension is if IT is a final fact-finding authority, will a faceless ITAT be uh, be a good experience or is it uh, recommended in that sense? And then, of course, we have this new tax portal, uh, the requirements and challenges of a pan-encrypted digital signature, which, uh, again, challenges, again, foreign companies having challenges on filing the return. So what has your experience been on, on this whole faceless thing? Uh, before we move that CAT, I just have sure. one of uh, two important points to make. I mean, this would be useful as uh, tax professionals. I mean, when we are managing the organization, one thing that we kind of uh, ensure that if they are looking at any position on, say, taking, uh, say, withholding tax position, the three things that is one is uh, we look at the risk level to take that position. So, and the material, of course, it all depends on the materiality of the transaction and the, uh, and the characterization of the payment, how uh, how easy or difficult to take, is, is it to take uh, that position based on, of course, the facts, evidences and the documentation we have on file. Uh, it's very important uh, as, a, as a tax function to maintain those defense files at this stage when we are filing the return. So, uh, so that two years later, we are at least audit ready. And, and this is important and key for at least the material transaction. So we don't have any hassles of a litigation later. So this is one important point I thought I should. Great, yeah. great. Thanks, thanks uh, agree, for sharing that. Yeah. So, yeah. So Rakesh, just coming back to you on this uh, whole faceless thing, what uh, uh, has been your experience? So CLJ, as such, means like, uh, uh, at least my experience was surprisingly pleasant on faceless. Okay, so uh, when the process has been very smooth, there were no uh, roaming inquiries actually. Okay, and uh, uh, whatever the questions which came, that was very very specific. And uh, once you have answered that questions uh, uh, on a very uh, lucid manner or very uh, means like self-explained manner. Uh, the uh, reverse queries were very less. Okay, so there was one or two round of uh, uh, round of uh, queries and cross queries actually. But uh, and then uh, uh, 
and other thing is that when the assessment started uh, in the notice itself we got the got the information these are the points number 1 1 to 5 these are the points on which your case has been selected for scrutiny okay. so at least we were prepared and we were ready with all those uh, uh, submission documentation on those issues and and most of the most of the queries has been in and around those uh, queries though there were certain additional uh, additional issue which was part on is like uh, they were very very uh, particular about reconciliation of the return with the direct tax and indirect tax what you have reported in your service tax return what is in your, reported in your uh, annual report okay so and there are uh, there are uh, uh, whatever the deduction or uh, additional claim which was made there are some certain queries around the deduction on uh, chapter 6a okay but uh, it it was means like it was not like that in uh, in uh, in the physical environment when we used to get the assessment done we used to give a bunch of the boxes file letters credit de detail creditor detail bring all expenses detail bring all asset detail bring all liabilities detail i think those were the thankless job which we used to do actually i think those were not there this time and uh, most of the time is uh, assessment process was very smooth uh, uh, though i heard lot of uh, lot of cases where that uh, uh, shoko notice has not been given and direct order has been passed there may be exceptional cases uh, but at least whatever the assessment which we have faced in the group uh, those assessment was very very smooth and uh, very reasonable assessment i would say sure sure yeah, great good, good good prashant and, uh, uh, any different experiences you want to share or your experience yeah. will largely been the same yeah no, we have uh, also have a good experience and not so good experience uh, in a sense that uh, in few of our assessments uh, uh, we we were having a very smooth experience whatever mm -hmm. details required uh, are considered and uh, uh, information is understood by them and we got a good order also i mean uh, base is the merit uh, submissions which is made and in uh, few of the other cases the submissions have not been understood so that's a challenge uh, probably cag which i see here is uh, something when we prepare the submission and we are able to explain the submission in physical hearing this would not have been happened that is my uh, perception uh, and i may not be totally correct also but then uh, i am seeing in the news that there are instances where the time given is very less uh, show cause notice is not issued video conferencing facility of course not worked last year and uh, then uh, there is an issue and uh, companies have filed writ in the high courts and the high courts have taken certain positions on this so so uh, if these ambiguities or these you know these issues in the faceless assessment is sorted out it will be a very good procedure in terms of transparency and audit and uh, and uh, immediately closing the assessments in a very transparent manner that is how i see it sure yeah vijayshree yeah. anything you would like to supplement yeah 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 absolutely see nobody can replace the opportunity that you get to interact physically with an eo i mean and then you can steer and navigate your conversation to the way you want and you understand how the officer is reacting definitely that can't be replaced in this uh, scenario but having said with a good objective that it was uh, initiated i would say yes challenges of any technology anything new that happens at the first season is now over and we are in the second season right now so i mean it comes with challenges and hiccups uh i guess uh, for me i mean yes one point that yes i see is the turnaround time is ridiculously short which which is something that it shouldn't be there because uh, unless unless we also as an organization move towards a technology driven document readiness i mean we at a click of a button you get all the documents ready and uh, it's all well in place so that uh, then i mean because of the timeline then the importance of technology also uh, kicks in and then you have to start thinking about that as an organization but yes overall our experience has not been uh, that adverse or bad i mean uh, it's a welcome move uh, by uh, the governments and i think um uh, only thing is relating to the turnaround time and yes video conferencing facility as mr prashant also said wherever possible i mean uh, wherever we are uh, getting that opportunity that should be kind of granted to the ssc rest all i i second the views of the other panelists 
So I think uh, time and technology perhaps two key uh, messages uh, or key takeaways from this. I think the more and more we are technology driven, both the taxpayer and the tax authorities, I think that is the way going to going uh, will be the way going forward in that sense. Uh, with that, if we move to the next session on litigation, and uh, before we go to the fact-specific uh, issues uh, on which litigation could arise, again, Vijayshree, uh, your thoughts again on litigation management, both vis-a-vis -vis, uh, maybe India and across India, and I'm sure you will be having litigation across various jurisdictions. How does one uh, manage that litigation? In the sense, not only from a process standpoint, but also technically on the ground uh, in that sense. Okay. So process and start with the process. Process standpoint standpoint now managing audits is one of the key thing of the entire organization and also considering the spread that we have in different geographies and this is one of the paramount uh, thing that keeping our risk levels low in terms of audits that we have. Uh, now when it happens to in terms of process what happens is we track these kind of audits on a quarterly basis and we have to do that as a process within the organization mm -hmm. and uh, suppose we come across it uh, apart from of course within the quarter there are some open audits then then of course we'll have to deal with it immediately what we do is we get into the fact pattern we see and analyze what documents we have what is the position we need to take what's the technical interpretation on ground for that and what is the key is the risk level so where is our risk to take that position so whether the risk is high low or or what is the next roadmap for that if we take a particular position do we uh, will, will be what are the chances of success what are the chances of like uh, the position being challenged so these this assessment is being done for every audits every key material audits and not the routine audits definitely routine audits are managed and uh, it's taken care with the help of local consultants but uh, when it looking at the material ones um, this risk assessment is the key we ensure we have those right documentation right opinions on our file then we know uh, the next steps what we need to do what are the costs involved so that entire cost benefit analysis is being done on the ground when we actually have an open audit uh, situation sure yeah. rakeshji coming back to you on the management of litigation uh, your initial thoughts so so cag uh, i think that management of litigation start right from uh, from the transaction level only okay so when we when we enter into any transaction uh, uh, at that point of time only we will have to uh, assess our tax position and there are certain tax position which where we are uh, where we are uh, uh, we are uh, aware of the fact that litigations are bound to happen on on, on these transactions or the position which we have been taken which we have taken so uh, what are the preparations for that what kind of documentation is available what kind of internal notes are available what kind of discussion notes with the professionals are available what opinions are there on the record so and whenever this uh, uh, whenever these issues are even audited in uh, in the statutory audit from contingent liability perspective so uh, so that the entire documentation is very key for that uh, second thing is that wherever the uh, impact is not material actually i think now these days litigation has become very very uh, uh, very very time consuming and uh, 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 and costly affair okay. so i think the entire thought process has also been changing in the in the uh, in the system that let us have least uh, least litigation let us not litigate on on any issue which on which success ratio is uh, chances of success are less or take some conservative position so at least we don't spend our time in uh, time in litigation and better that we uh, spend our time in uh, efforts in in next cost in, uh, in better manner uh, even even large litigation cg now these days are also discussed at audit committee level so we are very very careful that uh, and some of the audit committee members are also very very concerned about uh, about litigation if there are long pending litigations if there are uh, uh, litigations which are having uh, material impact on the profit and loss account so even our position may be very strong but uh, they will have their own concern because uh, the way uh, 
uh, law is dynam dynamic and uh, uh, you don't know means like uh, uh, this side the law will turn and uh, uh, your entire planning may get failed so i think these days uh, these days uh, 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 we are very very careful uh, litigating only where we are litigation un uh, inevitable but mostly most of the cases we will try that uh, things are settled at lower level and it taxes to pay better pay and uh, uh, and uh, spend your energy in some different areas rather than on litigation sure. so what i gathered maybe from vijesh hmm. and your discussion is assess the least risk level uh, documentation in that sense is time consuming and costly and of course uh, uh, even if you have strong position you need to be mindful on uh, how to take it litigation unless it is inevitable yeah uh, prashant uh, uh, any anything else you would want to supplement on this uh, yeah i totally agree with what uh, mr rakesh has mentioned and as well as with uh, ms vijay shree uh, and uh, we also see uh, and rather we also analyze the risk and we also see how the documents should be mentioned maintained at the document at the transaction level at the time of statutory audit at the time of tax audit and at the time of filing of return and we take certain positions based on the analysis of the uh, regulations as well as judicial precedents once that position is taken up and the year has come for scrutiny and basis the questions which is asked we try to minimize the risk at the assessment level itself by filing detailed submission explanations uh, information documentation whatever is required and see that at the assessment level itself the risk is minimized in terms of there should not be any uh, any additions uh, which is uh, which is very new or which is other than as expected uh, as per the expectation as per the past years experience etc and if it all come up then we take certain positions we evaluate how is the risk and how it will go at the higher appellate levels at commission appeals level at itat and uh, then we build up documentation in a sense when the matter will, will come up for appeal how the judicial developments happens for that particular issue and how are our case and how we can support it uh, basis facts of our case and also in terms of documentation and uh, that is how we see that how can we manage the litigation also and minimize the risk also look at the cost aspects of course we take the help of consultants counsel senior counsels in terms of opinions etc uh so so that's how i see it yeah some of the areas on litigation front present which we have highlighted is like the treaty interpretation of royalty fps and it has always been an issue for last many years and we still see litigation surrounding that and the other one may be uh, which may one may see uh, withholding tax on dividend and this will be perhaps both under the old regime under ddt where we have now looking at a scenario where where they can you claim a treaty benefit Uh, all it is referred to a special bench uh, by the mumbai tribunal but more under the new provision under the new uh, uh, classical system of taxation and this whole controversy surrounding the mfn clause so if you were to just look at these two aspects of royalty fts and the withholding tax on dividend do you see a lot of litigation surrounding that yes uh, because in my view uh, a lot of stakes are involved in these two uh, issues that is withholding tax on dividend and second is royalty and fts of course uh, from revenue perspective as well as from assessee perspective and uh, i will come to first dividend and then uh, probably royalty and fts uh, from dividend perspective uh, it's a welcome move that uh, uh, government has come up with withholding tax that is uh, classical system of uh, taxation rather than uh, ddt uh, and uh, but then the issue here is the rate which is mentioned in the act and rate which is mentioned in the treaty and whether assc is able to claim the beneficial rate which is mentioned in the treaty and whether it is a settled principle now or there are still questions in that principle specifically in view of the uh, judgment of the delhi high court in case of concentrics and uh, nestle uh, and wherein it is an it is accepted that uh, treaty benefit uh, Uh, basis the mfn clause can be taken you can still claim the beneficial rate which is given in the other treaty but then there are still uh, interpretational issues even after the judgment of the high court in terms of date of entry into force and whether that issue is still settled and whether we can still that take that position at the time of withholding or we will have to wait and watch 
uh, that is probably still not very clear and uh, and till that time it is not clear the working capital blockage will be there to that extent uh, that is uh, i see in terms of withholding tax on dividend secondly in terms of royalty and fts uh, in terms of royalty uh, for software payments there is a decision of supreme court now wherein they have mentioned that uh, software payments are not taxable as a royalty uh, however vis a vis there is no change in the act and uh, but then there is an equalization levy also which has come up if royalty and fts is not uh, uh, chargeable under income, income tax so we'll have to see how the cost impact of the commercial balance to uh, whole of the group rather than only to the to atlas copco india or to the company in india and uh, see uh, whether there is any cost impact in our case normally we withhold tax and we see that our foreign counterparts are able to take the credit and uh, we also analyze what is the impact on equalization lever other other aspects of the taxation I'll come back to on the equalization levy, and that's something which we will discuss later. But uh, we're just coming to you in the context of this royalty and FTS, and more with respect to software. Uh, any any uh, thoughts, experiences? Yeah, yeah. So here, definitely, this is one of the sensitive topic, or the, that uh, requires closer examination whenever we look at software payments. So because it goes to what is the predominant purpose for which the consideration is paid. one that is the key and whether that is for purchase of the software or it's for uh, commercially exploiting the ip in the software and this is very very important to examine or or whether it is incidental to the purchase of the software then 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 we of course there is a supreme court judgment but i am not sure how department is applying that supreme court decision so today also we would uh, want to take that conservative position of not getting into liquidation and sorry uh, litigation and then just see whether we clearly fall within royalty or we clearly fall within the piece uh, for uh, technical uh, services that is one point second yes if it is clearly purchase for shrink wrap software then definitely we we know it's a settled now that it's not a royalty but there also we would want to be conservative based on what documentation we have on uh, hand uh another point yes as mr prashant said that equalization levy is one of the another uh, areas where we have started looking into and which is like if it is not royalty or fts then yes equalization levy whether it uh, it applies and then yes the 40 uh, ia disallowance that's very important because even though it is not subject to tax we have to look at uh, what is the downside for us and if there is a disallowance so these and yes one more aspect when we are looking at fts is whether it is making available that uh, uh, whether it falls within within the make available uh, the, the, uh, technical skill or knowledge as per the treaty and we can take that position of a zero withholding tax now these are the aspects generally we look at when uh, we look at this software sure Uh, rakesh if i come to you uh, in addition to the uh, royalty fts uh, also want to get your thought on the next item on the uh, reopening of assessments and we have a spate of notices which we have seen being uh, issued by the department and also all of them being challenged in uh, in rates uh, given the new uh, provisions of reopening uh, if you can take that also and give your perspective on that yeah so coming uh, so before coming to that uh, CAG only on the software payment. Uh, uh, as a group, what we have done just wanted to share is that uh, wherever the past payments were uh, were uh, were tax was withheld and paid actually, and tax uh, was generally borne by the company. There we have we have amended our uh, our uh, TDS returns and we have uh, we have claimed the refund of those uh, uh, withholding taxes. So let us we it's a still wait and watch. how the department is going to take up that okay but i think supreme court decision was not goes much beyond that uh, shrink wrap so, uh, software actually so whether it is a uh, royalty or whether it is not a royalty i think that is a fundamental issue okay so so that is the uh, that's the on the software you ask for uh, uh, can i just forgot to be uh, opening of assessment for, Achha, but, but before that, on the software, hmm. very valid point which you make in the sense hmm. it's an opportunity for both the recipient and for those who have uh, done a tax cross up to claim the refund with respect to the past uh, taxes paid on software. Yeah, sure. I think everybody should explore that and uh, 
well, as on situation, uh, as on date, means like it seems that refund should be uh, should be available actually, and uh, uh, Supreme Court decision should be given much uh, benefit for that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, coming on that uh, reopening uh, uh, means like uh, uh, in June, a lot of reassessment re notices was uh, uh, was issued actually, and. Uh, See, practical aspect, uh, CAG means like if you go and talk to any lawyer, you go and talk to any any uh, any good tax consultant, the straightforward answer uh, answer was that uh, go and find the rate against that and challenge the reopening itself. But I think uh, what we have taken a position that we will we'll first look at that uh, uh, what is for the assessment has been reopened, what are the reasons for reopening, or whether those issues are are easy to handle or that can be explained in the reassessment proceeding itself. Okay, and instead of going and challenging the jurisdiction and uh, uh, litigating the matter, first uh, uh, first let us see what is the issue. Okay, so uh, so that's how we have dealt with that. In one or two cases, we have uh, challenged that uh, reopening itself also. So there are mixed kind of reaction. Uh, I think uh, jury is still out on that, and uh, we have already seen once uh, High Court decision, though it is a single member judgment, uh, Chhattisgarh High Court, which has taken a very view that uh, reopenings are uh, the way that uh, uh, relaxations has been given to the taxpayers, why that relaxation should not be available to the tax department, and why one should be means like prejudiced by that uh, reopening actually. So let's see how that uh, things pan out. But as we hear, uh, means like uh, government may not give up easily this issue. So let's see. Sure, sure. Prashant, mm -hmm. I know you have a view mm -hmm. on uh, this as well. Uh, yes. So, uh, of course, uh, the decision of the Chhattisgarh High Court, uh, wherein, uh, but then still, still there is a uh, there is a view whether uh, uh, the uh, the authority which is granted to CBDT by the legislature is only for extension of the notice to be issued under section 148A or it can also defer the enactment. That question still remains probably and uh, that is how we, we probably have to see how the, how the position evolves in this case. Yeah. And I think maybe... Uh... I may divide this into two buckets. One is for say assessment years 13, 14, and 14, 15, where the even the six years would have expired by March 21. And those notices yeah. which were issued, those perhaps one can take an argument there clearly beyond time, even under the notification. And the second one will be those years where the six years may still remain. Uh, and that may be as uh, uh, Rakeshji said. Uh, even if one were to succeed, whether one should go to read petition right now or will the department even have an opportunity later on to issue notices for those years because they may still go back with the six-year time window for those. But uh, yeah, I think uh, this is still a, a subject matter of uh, litigation and I'm sure we will see a lot of uh, things on that. Sure. If I was to come to you, maybe on the next uh, three, four other items on the litigation, like the impact of COVID on individuals and PEs, and we see the government issued a clarification for March 20, but no clarification forthcoming for March 21 uh, and forward. And likewise, from a permanent establishment perspective, uh, uh, no clarity vis-a-vis -vis what the OECD has stated in that sense. And then uh, uh, some aspects related to internet transfer tax, the clarification which the government has given and their intention to settle and so on. So, uh, uh, and anything on these two aspects before I uh, touch upon the AAR and the TDS assessments? Yeah, uh, yes, CAG, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, I think governments are, uh, have, have, we have taken certain kind of uh, amendments around, like because of COVID-19, the travel restrictions, and then yes, uh, there's a service fee that is created due to the presence of individuals even though you don't have a fixed place fee because of this unavoidable circumstances, you're stuck with the service fee. But there are several governments who have taken that uh, kind of removed that particular uh, restriction or say kind of given that leeway around uh, 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 around this uh, stay due to unavoidable circumstances. And I'm, I'm sure, I mean, even Indian government has done that. 
but i am not too sure whether that is enough and they have to kind of look uh, because uh, it's not, they had given that kind of uh, leeway during march of 2020 but what happened is covid extended and uh, after that we didn't see indian government coming up with any uh, any more clarifications around this this is a challenge and uh, uh, definitely as a group but uh, uh, we would want to be conservative here now travel has been restricted during this time due to covid but uh, definitely from a pe standpoint we would want to be very clear that this by itself due to covid and uh, people being stuck um, it does not conclude uh, on any pe position and uh, we will keep all those other defenses on file to uh, kind of come to that position so uh, that's how we are viewing it as a group um second uh, this was on indirect transfer tax now uh, while uh, my view is it is definitely a welcome move to end this long drawn litigation and those uh, kn and those in the, the companies getting those refunds but uh, we'll have to i, I think uh, from a from a standpoint that uh, we have to look at you know india as a welcoming destination for investments and we have to be mindful of that and i would kind of uh, see india like very forthcoming in that front on avoiding such kind of uh, such kind of provisions where after 7 years they they took 7 long years to kind of have this uh, retrospective amendment to be cancelled so which could have been very well avoided it was just because those kind of industries went to international uh, arbitration uh, to kind of attach government assets and not coming to this position actually this could have been much avoided much early this is my view no uh, that's that's the uh, right uh, vijesh and i think the reference on the impact of covid 19 was also discussed yesterday uh, in one of the sessions by uh, hema loi i think she also brought out uh, this issue surrounding the service fee and other things uh, on the indirect transfer tax as you rightly said it has taken 9 years so to say for the government from 2012 to 21 to come back to full circle and uh, more than the ease of doing business the ease of investment in india i think should be at the at the at the forefront so, cag um, in it means like in my personal view this is uh, this is not driven by the ease of doing business or ease of investment in india okay. these are driven because of what has happened in in at international level actually right the way court has I meant like uh, court has passed the order for seizing the asset of and to avoid any kind of uh, 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 and any kind of issues or as uh, saving i think this was the uh, uh, sure. this was the uh, option uh, this was a step taken what there are hundreds of other other issues so yep. it's like there are retrospective amendment on royalty before technical services right. there are there are number of issues on which retrospective amendment has been take has been uh, made and assessees is made to suffer it okay Right, rightly for you, Rakesh. I was just coming to that on the indirect transfer in the same Finance Act 22L. You had two retrospective. One was on the indirect transfer. The second was the royalty. Yeah. So no changes on the royalty. And the recent one we saw is on the amendment relating to goodwill and so on. So maybe time will tell if there is any changes on that. Yeah. Uh, Prashant, coming to you on this uh, replacing AR AR with BFAR and the TDS assessments. Uh, again, there has been some apprehension earlier uh, on the working of the AR. Uh, the cases were not decided now. Uh, that has been abolished, being replaced with BFAR, and a lot of issues on TDS assessments on wherever you make remittances which are uh, without uh, without any withholding tax. A lot of challenges surrounding that. So, you want to share some insights on that? Yes, C G. So, uh, first of all, we are waiting for constitution of BFAR after the announcement in the Finance Act, and that is constituted now on second of September. Uh, uh, that that is authority is constituted, but the uh, but the constitution of the uh, bench is pending not yet not yet yeah so so we'll have to see uh, how the how the pending cases will move to bar and uh, uh, how the new application will be filed what is what will be the procedure how the forms what will be the forms and formats and all that and how fast the authority takes up the cases uh, and what will be the fate of the pending cases because uh, uh, there are many ars which are pending because of the not functioning of the ar earlier and uh, because of the vacant positions in the ar and many are still awaiting to file uh, an application for, before bfar uh, because the authority is not constituted yet so so to 
so to have a clear certainty on certain positions uh, in case of uh, foreign payments or so we will have to uh, have a very clear uh, forum and uh, fast track resolution of the applications uh, am, I, am i audible because the my my screen is uh, freezing now. you are audible person yeah yeah okay okay that's good uh, secondly in relation to the tds assessments while uh, with making payment uh, while making foreign payments to either e or non e whomsoever uh, normally we take positions which is conservative and if there are very crystal clear positions in our own case uh, uh, which has happened earlier based on assessment on section 2011a uh, then we normally do not withhold tax because that has happened in our case but we see as a group the there should not be any substantial cost impact if at all there is some compact cost impact and that is accepted of the group that is fine but otherwise when we withhold we see that our counterparts are able to take the credit and we also see the documentation are maintained in a crystal way at the time of transaction level itself okay. on the bfir i think as you said perhaps uh, government should look at the bfir shouldn't go the same way like the ar in that sense they should not yeah. uh, get uh, loaded with cases which are not get decided and so on Vijayshree, coming to you on these two aspects, uh, uh, any insights on the AR being replaced with BFAR and TDS assessments? Yeah. So what I feel is, uh, of course, I'm uh, elaborating whatever I, I kind of second what uh, Prashant said. But uh, one point is, it's going to be pro revenue in my view because it's going to be principal CITs who are going to be like part of that BF BFAR. And of course, the effectiveness we'll have to see and test it uh, because we have not started. functioning so to say to get the right answer but one but the factors which are necessary to have a success i mean in functioning from a bfr perspective is one is the approach and attitude of the members and as prashant also said the time taken for disposal is very crucial the consistency of the orders and also success of the faceless mechanism for complex matters so these are some of the factors that we will we will need to see and test whether effectively this has uh, met the objective for which it was uh, formed that is that is my view on bfar now uh, the other point was on tds assessments now uh, tds assessments again uh, as a group we are pretty conservative in what positions we want to take because we don't want to end up in litigation and uh, considering our risk levels definitely we want to assess where we are that doesn't mean that we end up paying all the So our taxes without claiming any treaties. Definitely, we are conscious about the treaty availability and the benefit available. But it all depends on how much documentation we have on file and how strong is our position to substantiate that uh, particular uh, uh, view that we take. Rakesh ji, your thoughts on that? So, uh, so C J, I think uh, the A R has been a big disappointment actually. The V S. The entire purpose of AR was completely defeated. That meant purpose was to uh, to have a certainty into the tax position. Actually. Okay, and uh, if you if you want to take certain position or you want to have some view and you want to take us uh, to avoid the litigation, you go to the AR and in five, six, seven years you don't get any ruling. What is the meaning of that AR? So uh, so it become more complicated because. you don't know what position has to be taken and what department will do actually so uh, i hope the same uh, same thing doesn't happen for bfr of okay. uh, and uh, recent our in last four years uh, the gst advance authority experience has not been very good actually that uh, diverse ruling most of the time these uh, ultimately these are the adjudicating authorities and they are not whenever they are uh, sitting and hearing those cases they still uh, they are still in, on back of the mind they are more kind of ad adjudicating authority ra rather than a judicial authority there. so as uh, i completely echo what uh, vijay shree has said that because ultimately this will be this will be uh, had a, this will this will be made by uh, chief commissioners uh, it should not happen that uh, Uh, that will really they are more more kind of proactiveness and uh, uh, instead of give certainty it will create more uncertainty then okay so say the today's situation in gst it is it is means like it is very scary to go to the advance authorities because you you 
which ensure you are hundred percent sure that your decision is going to come against me. It hardly means like uh, there is a very very remote chance. Even if you know you go to the consul and ask them that whether we should go to the ER, they will say better you don't go to the ER. This is the situation. So uh, if that same thing happen with the BFR, uh, this uh, you know, this uh, newly constituted board, though it's uh, early days to uh, say this is very premature <laughs> views, but let us see. Uh, uh, how it pans out and whether it serves the purpose for which it is constituted. Yeah, just one uh, otherwise, point. It is, otherwise, it will another uh, CITP. Yeah, just one point I want to add mm. to what Rakesh said is in our case, we had filed an AR years back for an issue, I mean, which we wanted to get. And then uh, if the time taken was so long, there was also site visits. Uh, that our assessments got closed much earlier in a favorable way so we had to withdraw the AR. so i mean that's that's how our system is like where we have all those tools in place but we are not able to use it effectively as a taxpayer sure, sure. Rakesh, anything on tds assessment uh, tds assessment uh, uh, means uh, i don't know means like uh, uh, Means like we are acting as a government agent for collection of taxes, okay, and the way that uh, uh, the consequences of any any uh, means like uh, uh, position goes adverse on TDS is very very uh, alarming. Actually, so interest, penalties, prosecution, okay, and the way this TDS department has been active and uh, uh, very aggressive, I have never seen in my life. Uh, I think last three, four years, this uh, inevitably every year you have the TDS survey. Every every quarter you have that uh, 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 means like uh, uh, number comparison. Last time you paid this much of TDS, why this TDS is lower this time? So all those uh, explanation is being called. And uh, uh, TDS has never been so uh, area of uh, area of concern. But now these days, not only this international taxation, but domestic taxation also, uh, you have a lot of issues on the TDS assessment. And we are getting the notices on such a, such a, uh, such a means like a matter which we have never thought of that on these issues also, uh, the TDS issues. So if, uh, if you uh, deducted tax on the contractor, they will say notice 194C is not right, 194. So for, for one region or other region means like, uh, TDS demand has to be raised, and uh, I think this is an unfortunate part on our administration. And uh, means a lot of the kind of time is going in the TDS compliances is uh, is Herculean, Herculean. And now on top of this uh, TDS on the goods, means like uh, the entire tax departments, uh, tax functions, efficiencies are going in managing the TDS compliances. Right, right. I think on the AR, only thing I can say is that the fanfare, which it was started in 93, after 25 years, it has got diluted significantly. Hopefully, the BFAR does not uh, go under the same route. And uh, your point taken, I, can, I think Rakesh Ji and others as well on the administrative challenges on the TDS uh, assessments and documentation to be maintained. And we'll have to see what uh, the new TDS provisions which have been introduced on 194O and 194Q, how they pan out. And I'm sure there will be a lot of litigation on that. Uh, I'm mindful of the time as well. And with that, I think if you move to the uh, next segment on the various tax developments, uh, both in India and outside India. From an Indian perspective, of course, I think uh, uh, since we were talking of the first real taste of digital uh, taxation and the two amendments introduced on the significant economic presence and the equalization levy. Uh, uh, on the significant economic presence, while I think from a practical standpoint to the extent a taxpayer has a treaty benefit, it may be of uh, little relevance. But uh, what we have seen in practice is uh, this could also be an issue from a withholding tax perspective. And we see a lot of taxpayers, uh, in maybe Indian uh, companies, insisting on uh, a declaration that the foreign company does not have an SCP. Uh, and even if they have an SCP, then they will withhold at a higher rate, even though the payment may be in the nature of a royalty or an FTS. So where clearly it is covered under 916 or a 7, 911 should not apply. And then on the other hand, of course, from an equalization perspective, the wide definition of uh, online services 
and the whole objective of equalization levy being to cover digital uh, services whether it gets extended to physical uh, on uh, services which are offline as well and the whole debate on royalties uh, and fts versus equalization levy uh, maybe the payer may take away its royalty and withhold tax uh, or not withhold tax on the ground is subject to equalization levy and the recipient being of the equalization levy does not apply uh, and then of course the interplay between sct and sqq and eqm uh so maybe i will come come to you uh, prashant first on getting your perspective on this uh, how do you see this whole scenario yes ji yes. so in terms of uh, significant significant uh, economic presence uh, we normally deal with uh, associated enterprises and as well as with non associated enterprises also we take a declaration from them that they do not have a they do not have a scp in india that is one thing and we see that what are the provisions in the treaty and if uh, normally uh, they are exempt from uh, sap provisions based is the permanent establishment provisions in the treaty uh, secondly in terms of equalization levy uh, now uh, my view is probably uh, first of all industry at large is awaiting for a clarification on this for brick and mortar companies uh, that what is the intention of the legislature for bringing this provision Uh, that is still not clear but then by virtue of the defi- definition and very wide definition of online uh, every uh, every company which is dealing with uh, foreign counterparts in terms of import of goods or provision of services etc will fall into the definition of e-commerce operator and then uh, equalization levy is made applicable to them whether that is the real int- intention of the government uh, and uh, we, we expect some kind of clarification on this aspect from the government but then we have violated this and uh, taken certain positions in terms of facts of our case and how the processes are there how our erp interacts with our erp and then uh, the definition is very wide for online even a communication by way of an email is covered there uh, whether that is the expectation i mean my business model has not changed since last so many years uh, and uh, first earlier i used to interact uh, other than digital mode and now i am interacting in a digital mode does that falls me into the definition of e-commerce operator and whether this levy is made applicable to me this is a very strange kind of lobby and industry at large was discussing it at various forums and uh, seeking some clarification and clarification came in a way of widening the scope uh, so so this is something uh, probably uh, we need to see how how the position can be taken this is the current situation of the law and how best uh, probably we can minimize the risk sure i what i gather from your is that perhaps this is the next big area of litigation possibly so uh, with yes. that vijayshree what uh, get get your perspective on this yeah okay uh, so i i agree with you that this is next area of litigation so um, yeah on scp uh, uh, definitely i mean i second prashant's views here for a's for uh, aes uh, or coming back to non aes non aes we were we were taking pe declarations anyway now it is added to scp declarations so uh, so then that anyway is in our file which is always there for aes um, the pe exemption i mean we uh, we have treaties in place so it doesn't fall within that gamut of uh, pe uh, fall within the gamut of scp uh the point here is uh, on equalization levy yes equalization levy is something that we kind of monitor because now things are getting or business model is getting more online and there are various facets of this entire journey uh, uh where from the from the entire supply chain journey there uh, that there is an online intervention at some stage or the other but at the end of it considering or interpreting the entire provision or the objective for which this was this levy was introduced i mean we tend to take as a group on that intention perspective rather than getting into like reading it in bits and parts i know it is we are awaiting clarity in terms of how do we interpret and, and it is sort of an adverse reading at the moment but as a group we are taking a position that yes we need to read that as a whole and uh, if the entire journey is an end to end online with no offline service at the end of the day then we are taking a position that equalization levy applies and otherwise it doesn't uh, fall within that uh, levy so um, i think uh, that i feel is a more uh, justified uh, and reasonable uh, interpretation to take so that's where uh, we are going ahead with that 
and when we are talking about royalty fts and the interplay with equalization levy yes this so this is always in our cards and we definitely see first whether this uh, the nature of payment that is being made is falling within royalty and fts clearly if not then we get into the equalization levy because we'll have to look at the royalty fts first test that and then go to the equalization levy part so this is how we manage interesting interesting rakesh ji your uh, perspective on this so yeah <laughs> so definitely scp is uh, scp is that uh, new goes to be dealt with it. and uh, we are also closely looking at that and started having uh, assess the uh, impact of that where the transaction is with the non treaty countries okay and uh, there may be transaction with the treaty countries but treaty benefits not available because of trc not being there or trc is uh, uh, the manner in which trc is required not being there so in those situation whether we as a business as a to defend our position whether we should uh, uh whether should we should take the uh, uh, scp declaration also or, or whether the declaration itself is sufficient enough whether there is a risk of uh, uh it being treated as a business income and and ultimately tax is uh, at 40% or at uh, you may be uh, caught under 163 in the, uh, uh, in future so all those things are critically looked at uh, uh, at uh, cg but i think these are very very initial days uh, there are a lot of lot of confusions on that still still that uh, notification on 15 cscb that it is not required for the goods import is still available so uh, there are a lot of uh, lot of customers lot of this uh, vendors are not willing to provide the declarations okay because competitors may not be asking also some industry players may not be asking so these are practical challenges as on date i think uh, things will get uh, uh, settled over a period of time uh, but this is the this is the uh, new area of concern and uh, as you rightly said there may be there may be lot of litigation around this scp also unless central government comes out with clear cut uh, uh, clear cut uh, uh, regulations or clear cut rules around that so even that even presuming that there is scp okay still there is no there is no rules available for income attribution you can't say that entire income will be attributed to it so what 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 ratio of income should be presumed that it is attributed to india and on uh, on which taxes to be paid or taxes to be deducted so all these things are still still under questions or still clarification is awaited and uh, uh, transaction to transaction we are taking positions yeah Sure, sure. No, very, very, very thoughtful insights, mm -hmm. Rakesh. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure India is not the only country who has introduced uh, the digital tax. And if we see the developments across the uh, globe, every country wants its uh, share of pie, so to say, of the tax rules. And uh, we have listed a few amendments or few developments overseas, uh, beginning with uh, Australia having its uh, own gar multinational uh, anti avoidance law, the diverted profit tax. then we had the tech mahindra ruling a uh, very different interpretation was given from the treaty perspective the treaty can be a uh, charge as well even though there was no charge under the domestic law then we have the european union uh, mdr which is the mandatory disclosure rules uh, directive on administrative corporations france has the digital service tax uk has the diverted profit tax and digital service tax and the us of course has introduced its own uh, guilty regime and uh, beat regime so to say so uh, and, and of course many other countries as i said were, every country wants its share of pie uh, so india is not the not the only isolated case who has been making this uh, unilateral changes so to say in its tax regime uh, and uh, vijayshree maybe coming to you first wanted to get your perspective on how do you view these changes and managing these changes uh, uh, all these developments happening overseas Yeah, so so CAG, this this part, yes, you're right. The countries are unilaterally taking all those steps because till the time OECD actually reaches a consensus and all the member countries are agreeable to that consensus on this solution, till the time what we do is we track it on a monthly basis on where are the updates, what's going on across the world uh, in terms of yes, France and then seeing Australia and then there is UK. 
so this is more on digital service tax, but apart from this, there's also this DAC 6, et cetera. So uh, we have to track this monthly and see whether where we are crossing threshold. Of course, there are different countries come up with different, uh, the scope is very different. Like say some are only for, uh, trying to plug in the online advertisement revenues. Some are taking, I mean, a broader view, just like equalization levy in India, it is very broad and uh, it uh, kind of widens the scope. So this particular aspect of tracking across the globe, and especially for our material countries, we are actually, we need to track and as an organization on a monthly basis where these regulations are adding to, whether we fall within that, whether any of our business line or uh, the business model that we have falls within that and uh, see the thresholds then accordingly take those steps for compliance. But yes, sir, this is a cumbersome thing till we actually see consensus across the world on uh, this front. Yeah, and TPT is a very dangerous provision, uh, diverted profit tax, and uh, we are pretty mindful of that provision, uh, especially when we are looking at UK and certain key countries where we operate, that we are not kind of having substantial functions in those and it's which is not compensated and we are not ending up falling within this gamut because it's pretty draconian to the extent of 25% of tax. So um, more than the corporate tax rate in the UK. So likewise, uh, definitely our structuring of our arrangements, I mean, uh, has to be, I mean, definitely now at the, as we speak, the way the world is going in terms of the regulations, uh, the profits should sit where the value is generated and where we have those functions being uh, rendered. So, so that is always the key and uh, uh, the profits have to sit there and the taxes rightfully should be paid there. Uh, yeah, so in summary, definitely a lot of changes across the country and we have to be mindful. We are geared up towards and constantly look at where uh, things are moving and whether we fall within the threshold or not. So, uh, Prashant, before I come to you, uh, I think the point which Vijayashree made is with respect to levy the taxes or collect the taxes where... Uh, so to say, the market economies or the consumers are, and which also brings us to this whole uh, uh, other developments, which is the MLI pillar one, pillar two, and the domestic measures which countries are uh, incorporating. So, want to get your perspective as well, both with respect to the changes overseas and with respect to say the pillar one, pillar two approach. Uh, your perspectives on that. Uh, yeah, you. Is it me? Uh, yes, Prashant. Sorry, Prashant, okay. you. Yeah. Okay, okay. I thought it is Vijish. Uh, yes, uh, CAG. So, uh, in terms of the overseas development in the uh, development in the foreign regulations about taxation aspects, that is looked after in our group by respective uh, tax team of the respective jurisdiction and also at the headquarters. So, I am not much aware of those regulations. Uh, uh, regarding this pillar one and pillar one and pillar two development which has happened and which has just come up in July, and wherein the final agreement will happen in the month of October, we have prima facie analyzed how it will impact uh, overall our group, and uh, we see that probably pillar one will not be applicable to us and pillar two will be applicable to us, and there might be certain jurisdictions where we wherein we will have to pay uh, uh, top up tax on the effective tax rate to achieve the global minimum tax rate of 15%. Uh, that is how we see it. Sure. Rakeshji, sure. any insights on this? I think this is a, this is a area which is closely uh, watched. Uh, this is the development which is closely watched. Actually. So as a group, uh, we may have operations in a lot of the low tax jurisdiction countries actually. So how that entire uh, once these uh, once these things are implemented, so that overall impact on the group's uh, tax outflow, ETRs, and all those analysis is being done. Uh, but I think a uh, 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 lot of clarity will come over a period of time. Uh, uh, so uh, this entire digital economy or taxation on digital economy is uh, uh, is clearly looked at actually. Okay, so it may it may it may change the entire the way you uh, do the business and the way the tech costs are uh, captured in the system. Sure. Yeah. Vikashi, any last words on the yeah. pillar one, pillar two? 
yeah pillar one pillar two definitely as a group once this came and the g7 support came on this pillar one pillar two i mean uh, immediately as a group i mean the management was uh, very uh, very about it on how this is going to impact us so uh, yes but we have been tracking since oecd came out with this uh, uh, white paper etc uh, yes as mr prashant also said we also as a group had to kind of make some high level estimate on what is the impact of pillar 2 and how it will impact our group it will it is going to take uh, at least a year i, I believe and it will i i am sure the earliest possible time that i can see is 2023 and not before that but yes as a group we have to be mindful of okay what would be the tax cost and whether we make a provision as a group and how will it impact us uh so that exercise yes we have to be ready as a uh, tax function and that's what we have taken as a step uh the only thing is what i would like to say is like with growing complexity around each and every country bringing in digital their own regulations and measures i think uh, we uh, it it is much required that there is more simplicity in compliance is a consensus based approach across countries because at the end of the day the objective uh, is that each country pay, has gets its fair share of tax and and if that objective is met in a very simplified way for taxpayers it's much better thank you thanks vijay ji uh, that was very nice uh, but too good to be true possibly but let's see how the companies uh, or countries come to a consensus before i uh, uh, defer to uh, rakesh for questions a quick 30 second uh, comments from each of you on what uh, are the top 3 focus areas uh, that you see going forward and vijay ji if i can start with you okay so for me the top 3 uh, focus areas is one is of course uh, achieving that 100% uh, uh, or say okay having control over the taxes of the group so that has always been the focus area on the etr for the group and how do we effectively manage the etr for the group second uh, it has been compliance compliance is very very key now and that is of focus and there is more transparency across countries so therefore uh, compliance achieving that 100% compliance and keeping our risk levels low on any positions that's the second uh, focus area uh, the third of course taking those proactive uh, measures to be ready for any new changes that is happening across the globe so these are the three main focus areas for me thanks thanks vijay rakesh if i come to you yeah so i think uh... Uh, i would say that the three main focus areas uh, definitely number one is that uh, having that uh, etr within the tolerance limit second is that uh, digi- digitization and automation is uh, uh, the way the te- uh, uh, the th- uh, government has actions has been taken at government level i think we need to keep pace with that and uh, we have to ready with our own system and processes are completely uh, 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 less human intervention and more of digitization and automation part and third is that managing compliances and litigations so i think these are the three focus area which i would say great thanks and finally prashant your thoughts mm. yes 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 so my view is that the first is in relation to compliances how are we going to effectively manage the compliances in a most efficient way vis-a-vis the developments which is happening on a day to day basis also in relation to automation automation is the key to minimize the risk that is uh, as rightly said by other panelists also so so that is one thing uh, wherein uh, we need to see how we can minimize or optimize the tax cost and minimize the risk by doing a better compliance by automation by taking the right positions and uh, having a uh, having a probably uh, probably you can foresee how the things will evolve on certain positions which were taken and then probably proactively act on that that is in terms of compliance second is uh, this faceless litigation which is coming up or which has come up now and how do you react <clears throat> or how do you face the faceless litigation in terms of assessments appeals and tribal if it happens that is that is second challenge probably or focus area rather than challenge uh, and uh, third is uh, basically how to deal with the department system 
after you deal with the compliance and the litigations in your quarter favorable position then how do you deal with the department systems to get the money back into the company that is uh, another focus area i really see <laughs> thank you sir thank you very thank very you. interesting very interesting uh, i think what i take away is of course technology is going to play a key role uh, going forward for all the compliance and automation and uh, prashant very nicely said how to face the faceless perhaps will be one uh, one area and the third one is while we may get success on the litigation front how ultimately it gets translated into actual refunds or effect orders uh, and how to work around the department to get that so thanks thanks for all that uh, insights uh rakesh that's all we had from the panel uh, back to you uh, i know we are short of time we're just on time but if you think we have any time for questions yeah i think we are on the top of time but we'll only take one question which is quite interesting and important for all of us uh, that is coming from mr samir gandhi the question is is board and audit committee evaluating tax risk as low medium and high categories as per the facts of the case and there is a related uh, two uh, questions on that uh how what are the thoughts from corporate governance perspective and how independent directors are now taking positions so anybody would like to take this question audit committee corporate governance and independent directors yeah so i can sh share my experience again as i uh, as, I, as i said my initial remarks also i think uh, what the experience over last uh, uh, as couple of years now board and as well as audit committee has become more uh, uh, very concern about the continuity okay. yeah so uh, means like uh, now this is the area of discussion almost in every uh, every quarter audit committee that what are the new litigation what is happening under the old litigation if the, what are the what are the open litigations whether there is any any outflow is possible whether the position which company has taken whether it is duly supported by the uh, consultants opinion what has been development over a period of time in in uh, on those issues and uh, mostly large matters are regularly discussed at uh, at uh, uh, at board level or at uh, audit committee level even not for that uh, any any last transaction whether it is acquisition whether it is divestment or whether some internal structuring uh, generally we we present over what is the tax position which has been taken by the company what has been uh, 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 opinion which has come from the consultant okay sometime we'll bring the consultant only to uh, to uh, present the tax position to, to the audit committee and explain that this is the position which has been taken and this is how it can be defended so uh, and uh, simultaneously uh, Uh, at the audit committee we have seen wherever the uh, operations are uh, uh, multi locational or international business they are also very cognizant or they want to understand what are the impact of various development is being taken place is uh, uh, is uh, uh, is going on and how that company's uh, 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 tax uh, uh, tax outflow will be impacted or the any any additional tax is going to come on in the pnl accounts so tax is not a tax is a uh, uh, definitely area of uh, discussion at uh, board level as well as audit committee level thank thank you rakesh ji for your transparent views uh, we are on top of the our uh, uh, the questions uh, i would request wrc to to please pass it on to ca gupta sir and uh, he will uh, appropriately respond with the panelist uh, may i request ca madhuri to give a, a hearty vote of thanks to all our panelists and the moderator thank you sir good morning all uh, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge our panelists ca vijay shri rangnathan madam ca prashant gandhi sir ca rakesh gupta sir and our moderator ca gupta sir uh, for a wonderful session and a discussion on a managing a task risk planning for a future road ahead thank you all for your valuable inputs and the insightful information Uh, looking forward for us to many uh, discussions from you all thank you thank you thank you thanks a lot thank you Uh, our next panel uh, has already come uh, but uh, on the request of the participants let's take a 5 minute nature break uh, and immediately come back thank you thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you thank you bye bye bye
How are you, sir? Fine, fine. वो क्या है रूम में एसी लगा है ना बाल कोर्स छिड़ेगा तो हरि को दर्शन देना पड़ेगा हितेश का बैकग्राउंड इज हितेश यू आर इन सम लाइब्रेरी और व्हाट नो नो नॉट बैकग्राउंड इज अ रियल लाइब्रेरी हितेश एंड योगेश हैज गॉट रियल लाइब्रेरी नहीं योगेश भाई का तो मेरे को पता है हितेश का क्या है कि रिफ्लेक्टिव लाइब्रेरी है आधा लाइब्रेरी है और आधा रिफ्लेक्शन है ग्लास में हितेश बराबर ना नहीं बात है। और सच सच बात ये है किसी को बोलना नहीं मेरे घर में कोई भी किताब रखना मना है सिवाय इस जगह पे तो सभी जो किताब है वो एक बैठी है आई कांट आई डेयर नॉट टेक एनी थिंग आउटसाइड अब किसको बोलेंगे हम बोलेंगे तो तेरे को ही बोलेंगे ना वही तो पता ना नहीं लेकिन किसी को कि भाई ये क्यों सब यहाँ पे पाइल पड़ा है <laughs> वही तो लोग तो क्या समझता लोग तेरे को किताबें देना बंद कर देंगे नहीं नहीं किताबें <laughs> देना नहीं किताबें देना तो मोस्ट वेलकम तो आई ऑलवेज लुक फॉरवर्ड बट स्टिल फॉर द सेक ऑफ माई वाइफ माई वाइफ ऑलवेज से यहाँ रख दी वहां रख दी कहीं रख दी एक जगह पे रखो and fortunately i have found a good helper who every four weeks we clean up one one portion of the library book nikalte hain rule saaf karte hain wapas rakhte hain acha hai koi padhne nahi baith jata hai padhte hain kabhi kabhi abhi kya hai na ye isko main bolta hu anti library books i buy but can't read because of my job jo din jo din job chhod dunga bas yahi kaam karunga नहीं तब ये पढ़ के वापस लिखने का भी काम करेगा ना भाई इसमें बट इट्स रियली फैसिनेटिंग आजकल द काइंड ऑफ बुक्स दैट आर अवेलेबल थैंक्स टू अमेजॉन आउटस्टैंडिंग हेलो टीपी सर हेलो हितेश बाय योगेश बाय हितेश वेलकम टू डब्ल्यू एस वो विनर नेवर चीट्स बोलता है ना तू ऐसी बात है हां वही वो भी लास्ट लिया वो मैंने लास्ट किताब वही लिया अभी नारायण मूर्ति साहब ने बोला लास्ट आई ऑर्डर दैट वन ओनली सो आल्सो आई ऑर्डर दैट आई गॉट अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग रीडिंग गुड मॉर्निंग ओसवाल सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग हितेश भाई गुड मॉर्निंग योगेश भाई यू आर नॉट कंटेस्टिंग इलेक्शन नहीं सर नहीं हां यस सर बैक टू बी अ टेक्नीशियन नो दैट इज अ प्री कंडीशन नो all of the wrc program <laughs> yes <laughs> okay so right 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 so the code of conduct has started see please keep right. in mind the requirement of hitesh gajaria that the program will come to an end automatically at 1:30 no, 1 o'clock oh sorry 1 o'clock 1 o'clock 1 pm sir 1 pm 1 p- i'm so sorry sir so he What? has to be with his in-laws oh and th- there is no choice he has Okay. Okay. So therefore, run the program in time if you want to complete. Yeah, yeah. We'll start in. And next if you want us to complete only two minute. case studies, we'll be delighted. So in no, that, no. if you are taking two, then I'll take Yogesh and Hitesh as first. Yeah, we have up to one third. Yeah, right. One o'clock. No, one, uh, o'clock. one o'clock. One o'clock. Okay. One o'clock. You want to can take. Okay. <laughs> you can't make an exception with in-laws. <laughs> fine. Fine. Uh, so maybe uh uh webo would you like to start mishra ji may i suggest one thing uh, sure. avoid the introduction just say accepting the names etc that's all don't give long introduction okay. at all because that will okay. save some 5 minutes wirc ke program mein ye ek maza interesting program part hota hai ki the introduction takes almost 20 minutes and very interesting okay. 
fine fine only we uh, as a speaker uh, enjoy lines. our introduction fine. you know we don't have any choice <laughs> Uh, Mr. Ji, have you started? Vai Bhav, are you there? Un ka nature call jara lamba chala hai. To aap bhi start kar do kya hai isme? No, no, they have to start the recording, na? No? Oh, hey, recording I has already started. This is recorded. Okay. Going on. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so welcome back, uh, uh, dear our CA friends. So we now have the next panel, which will be uh, having a brainstorming sessions and a brain trust for all of us. Uh, so we have uh, CA Yogesh Thar uh, from Bansi Mehta and Company, a renowned uh, speaker at various forums and has written n number of books. Uh, welcome, Yogesh Bhai, uh, to this session. My pleasure. Uh, we also have uh, Hitesh Bhai. Uh, no introduction required for him as well. Uh, uh, he is not only a well-known personality, but is always active on the social media as well. Uh, so he is again, uh, uh, you know, with us, uh, sharing all his knowledge uh, that he has gathered over several decades now. And finally, uh, we have our international guru, T.P. Oswal, sir. Uh, uh, at this session today is uh, 5th September, the Teacher's Day. Uh, and we all know that uh, Sir, students are not only uh, doing flourishing uh, tax practice, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. they are there everywhere. You name the big four partners, you name international uh, firms, you will find sir students everywhere. I'm one of those students. Uh, welcome, uh, Oswal, sir, on this Teacher's Day. It's Thank right you, to have you here. So the forum is all uh, yours, sir, uh, to start Thank with. You. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning to all of you. We have three case studies prepared uh, and sent to us, and uh, we have to deal with all the three case studies uh, one by one because we are. I am moderator, come panelist, so therefore you know. Th thanks to Hitesh, so I had to prepare one case study. Otherwise, I was trying to skip the responsibility by asking asking two BSM and BSR firms to handle these case studies. Both are interchangeably. Last word is only last for letter is different. So now, anyway, the first case study I have to deal with. Second one will be dealt with by Yogesh, and third one is uh, uh, Hitesh. Of course, we will inter intervene as and when we feel it is necessary in the answers of uh, the case studies given by one of the panelists. That has been the fact pattern which we decided and discussed. The first case study is a bit uh, uh, interesting. I would not say bit interesting. It is interesting. Uh, this is a case where uh, uh, re-domicile of a company is envisaged, which is uh, recently a subject matter of discussion before the Bombay Tribunal. Though <laughs> earlier also the Bombay Tribunal had an occasion to discuss this matter. And incidentally, by the same judge who had but it was not uh, specifically for surface as a re-domicile case. It was a case where the tax residency certificate was already issued by uh, Mauritius authority and therefore he went on the premises that is a Mauritius uh, entity, not a company, though entity. It was a case of Cartier shipping. Uh, the matter is pending before Supreme Court, but uh, we are now discussing the case studies which has arisen on account of very interesting decision recently uh, given by Justice, our uh, uh, member of the tribunal, Pramut Kumarji, in the case of Asia Today Limited. Here is a case where BVI company is incorporated in BVI in 1991. Please note the fact mm -hmm. very carefully. We have, in, this party has incorporated the company in BVI in 1991. At that time, it, they could have incorporated the company in Mauritius as well because we had a treaty with Mauritius from 1984. And Mauritius declared itself to be a, a financial center in 1991. It is an investment holding company uh, in various operating companies of the group in India. But in the fact pattern, they have said Indian companies. It can be assumed that BVI companies shares uh, substantially derive value from the assets located in India. In other words, BVI has uh, virtually an Indian company which is substantial only and there are no other other than India 
assets in BVI company or substantial assets. BVI is contemplating to migrate. Now, this is contemplating to migrate to Mauritius company for the following reason. There are four reasons given. Conducive regulatory requirement environment, especially for funding. Transparent legal and financial ecosystem. Mauritius is an FATF uh, compliant country or ISO, IOSCO compliant country. Uh, I would take a view that as per the present uh, dispensation, Mauritius is not an FATF compliant. It is in the gray list of FATF. Benefit from, though in October review is going to go on, benefit from favorable tax environment. BVI and Mauritius both permit redomicilization as per the laws of BVI and Mauritius. Redomicilization does not create new legal entity. This is what the presumption has been given by the person who drafted the case study. The India does not have a treaty with BVI, but has a treaty with Mauritius. Benefit under the Indo-Mauritius tax treaty is all well known to all of you. Recently, we have reduction in the dividend withholding tax of 5% and the capital gain tax was not leviable in case of the shares acquired prior to 1st April 2017, which is grandfathered. On domicilization, BVI company is not likely to face an issue in obtaining the tax residency certificate from Mauritius. These are the facts given. And based on these facts, few questions have been raised, five questions have been raised, whether re amounts to a transfer under section two, subsection 47 of the Income Tax Act 1961. That, that is the first question. And second is whether BVI company uh, can avail that is after de, de, we should presume that after de, 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 re, re domicilization, the benefit of 5% TDS on the dividend under Article 10 of the Indio, 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 sorry, India Mauritius DTAA uh, as Mauritius TRC will be available and blah, blah, blah. Various facts have been given in the case. Can somebody load those questions or a fact pattern uh, on the uh, on the screen so that it will be benefiting to the participant unless it is already shared with the participants. Let us start uh, answering this question, examine this question. Please note BVI law permits re -domilization. So also Mauritius law does permit re -domilization. Section 184, one of the BVI Companies Act and Section 296 of the BVI uh, Mauritius Companies Act permit for the time, for, for paucity of time, possibly I will not read those uh, relevant provisions of the uh, Income Tax Act of the BVI, Companies Act of the BVI and Mauritius. Now the question is, that therefore, as per BVI Companies Act, company does not cease to exist as a legal entity pursuant to redomilization to another jurisdiction because there could be legal obligations which were, uh, which were, uh, agreed upon, created, vested rights were created prior to the re redomilization The Companies Act of the BVI recognizes those act, uh, those rights, and they say, despite the, the uh, uh, transfer of the entity from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, we will continue those rights, and there will be the parties will be entitled to file suit against the BVI company in jurisdiction of BVI. Uh, Mauritius Companies Act. Registration of this uh, section 300 of the effect of registration is given under the Mauritius Companies Act. Registration of a company incorporated outside Mauritius under this act shall not create any new legal entity. This is important. They say it will be considered as a legal entity continuing and not a separate new entity. Prejudice or effect the entity of the body corporate constituted under the act of the foreign entity. Effect of the prop, effect the property right and obligations of the company. It will not affect, affect. It will not affect the proceedings by the or against the company. And therefore, as per Mauritius law, also re domilization does not create a new legal entity. These are the principles kept in the mind while drafting the question. And this question has come up because mainly the con, the the authority for sorry the Bombay Tribunal has dealt with this particular issue. 
and re redominalization was very um, quite popular in some of the jurisdictions in the world though please note india does not recognize so far redominalization absolutely whether redominalization amounts to a transfer that was the first question under section 247 of the income tax act look at the definition of transfer transfer in relation to a capital asset include sale it is not a case of sale exchange it is not a case of an exchange because same entity one entity closes second entity comes into existence and assets are transferred to the second entity relinquishment of assets it is not a case of relinquishment of an asset but it is fourth limb which is important is it a case of extinguishment extinguishment of any asset and there is an issue which possibly if you look at various decisions of the indian uh, courts and like, like particularly grace colis bombay sorry supreme court it says it amounts to an extinguishment of an asset and therefore possibly one could argue that it is a case of an extinguishment of an asset however there are number of consequences of that so what the grace colis says uh extinguishment of right cannot be independent of extinguishment of an asset so therefore if extinguishment of rights takes place upon the existence of an asset then that could be covered but if the, here the asset has not extinguished asset is transferred from one jurisdiction to another and therefore somebody may argue to distinguish uh, grace colis decision in this particular case recently this bombay tribunal in the case of india uh, india today limited has accepted the concept of re corporate redomicilization and also referred to as continuation as explained as the process by which the company moves its domicile that is place of incorporation from one jurisdiction to another by changing the country uh, where it was registered incorporated while maintaining the legal status we have very interesting decision which comes up, which also needs to be considered we have advance rulings decision in the case of banka sala that is 72 tax month 360 in which it is argued that explanation 2 to section 247 of the income tax act is not attracted in case if there are unless there are two parties involved in a transfer so parties for transfer the, the, the in order to attract a transfer there must be two parties involved here is the case extinguishment is taking place of one company and then thereafter new entity comes into existence there are no two separate parties as such both parties are same and therefore this is not a case of an extinguishment we have interesting decision of a tax pin engineering manufacturing works in bombay bombay high court 263 itr where in the bombay high court held that conversion of a firm into a company did not result into transfer as the firm was merely treated as company for transfer of a capital asset two important ingredients are required existence of a party and the counter party and secondly incoming consideration co the transferor so there is no two parties involved and there is no consideration involved so this is the ingredient and hence it is not considered as a transfer uh well whether bvi company can avail so therefore in the light of all these explanation possibly one can argue it out that this is not a case of a transfer and this is not a case therefore liable to tax under section 247 of the income tax act 1961 and hence the first can answer can be given in favor of the uh, uh, the, the tax payer however there could be various other arguments and uh, against the tax payer will come up which will take up little later so i would like to take the view both pros and cons as far as this case is concerned uh, it is not as simple as change of registered office from bombay to delhi or delhi to bombay if you under the companies act in india if you transfer your registered office from bombay to delhi the company entity the entity remains the same only place of its uh, uh, incorporation has under place of registered office is undergone a change and therefore entity remains same and therefore there is no entity remains same there is no transfer whereas in case of a redomicilization you are virtually liquidating one company you are closing down the entity 
and then you are opening new entity in mauritius another another country and assets and liabilities are get transferred to that entity and hence the question can come up that it is not akin to even uh, it, it it is not akin to the exemption it is liable to tax that will be one view which has been tested at a higher forum in india in asia today in asia today's case the re references have been made by the uh, judges while deciding uh, the case not in a very detailed manner but they have taken into account that they have finally concluded it not a transfer not a new new company uh, it is not a case of a transfer under section 247 now then second question if it is not a transfer whether bvi company can avail benefit of section uh, article 10 of india mauritius treaty after it is transferred to the mauritius in other words you have transferred assets and liabilities to mauritius now mauritius company is holding indian company and indian company declares dividend now under the india mauritius tax treaty article 10 says dividend tax which should withholding tax should be 5% and therefore when we took, now we are in the regime of withholding tax on the dividend unless earlier it was uh, there was dividend distribution tax payable by the company however number of people have still arguing that even in the case of dividend distribution tax the rate of tax should be as per the treaty rate 5% and therefore difference should be uh, received as a refund but whom that is an issue by itself now here withholding tax should be applied as 45% if you accept the proposition that it is a continuation of the company redomicile has taken place from bvi to mauritius and therefore why 5% withholding tax should not apply one view is yes it should apply and we have uh, a number of decisions on the subject whereas contrary views are also possible because we have the advance ruling authority consistently holding the view mauritius treaty benefit will not apply in case it is only a conduit and uh, it is held by the us entity the latest being tiger global uh, the bombay tribunal took a view in the case if it is a us entity held by mauritius three companies who in turn hold the indian company but mauritius companies are not uh, the beneficial owner and since they are not beneficial owner because ultimately they passed on the benefit to us entity and therefore mm, the mauritius treaty is not entitled to the concessional rate of tax benefit of withholding tax under the india mauritius tax treaty whereas we have number of host of the bombay tribunal and other other decisions which supports no the treaty benefit is available even to the mauritius company uh, despite the fact uh, that uh, the lower rate of tax will apply because mauritius company is holding the trc uh, from given by the mauritius authority and we have direct decision on the subject we have a circular 789 we have a supreme court decision in the case of a, 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 a this azadi bachao andolan and even this asia today decision talks about that and therefore these decisions are in favor 5% treaty benefit should be available uh, contrary as i told you uh, tiger global 116 taxman which says uh, it should not be given and they have said very clearly uh, if it is substantiated that uh, uh, morish bvi company is redomiciled in mauritius uh, and the primary object of availing the treaty benefit uh, now this will i will come to little later Uh, india mauritius treaty does not have principal purpose test india mauritius treaty is still not incorporating all the recommended changes under the mli we have not yet uh, recognized each other's treaty so far though india is very eager to do that i am told negotiations have gone through but not yet been notified and therefore the conditions like lob slob or principal purpose test does not exist in mauritius and therefore you should be able to argue it out uh, in the new environment the benefit of mauritius treaty for dividend purposes should also be available and uh, uh, and if that is the logic case even the grandfathering benefit should also be available to if the shares are now held by mauritius next question is whether the grandfathering benefit could be available to the new mauritius entity which is holding shares but assume that god grandfathering was allowed only up to those shares held up to 31st march 
However, the transfer has taken place after 17 and uh, the, the redomicile has taken place after 17 and therefore uh, the question arises is whether grandfathering pro provisions will apply to the shares which were held by BVI, which got uh, reclassified uh, as owned by Mauritius company. I would not say transfer, reclassified as owned by redomiciled company that is in Mauritius company, whether it is entitled to uh, uh, grandfathering. If we take a view, 5% benefit of the treaty is available to the Mauritius treaty. Then the question is, Mauritius, if the, and, and it is a continuing entity, the issue will be why grandfathering should also not be available to the, uh, the, to the Mauritius entity. However, the view uh, substantially against this particular proposition is because of if the GAR is applied, then in the grandfathering circular, they have said GAR will not apply for the grandfathering purposes. However, for various other reasons, if the GAR is applied, then possibly Mauritius Treaty cannot, be, uh, can, cannot get the advantage of grandfathering. And here, why Mauritius companies, this grandfathering could impact uh, Mauritius Treaty, I will give you the reasons for that. And if you look at that, possibly the, the answer would be against. And therefore, both views are possible. And therefore, this is one area one has to travel very, very, very carefully, whether uh, I would be able to take grandfathering, but yes, subject to taking the risk of contesting till the Supreme Court, because this matter has to go to Supreme Court, you will be able to argue it out and you can take a chance. In Supreme Court, ultimately, nobody can guarantee today what will happen. So the question is whether the GAR will apply in such a situation. If you look at the provisions of GAR, possible contention by the tax department will be uh, will be that the main purpose, section, uh, even in 1991, Mauritius was in existence. The treaty was in existence. You could have set up the company in Mauritius rather than shifting the company incorporated in BVI to Mauritius. And that is to main take advantage of the uh, India-Mauritius tax treaty. The reasons which you have given in the case study, because these are based on the theoretical fact given to us, we are discussing and not, uh, so the possibly in the real life, you may try to improve those facts so that you can you can come out with the uh, answer more favorably. The facts which have been given are conducive regulatory uh, framework uh, that existed in 91 also. What was the conduciveness which has come in the Mauritius after 91? Only thing is, uh, you may say number of banks have gone up in Mauritius. It has India become more friendly. The, uh, India's business has gone up with Mauritius, but that is not the answer. India's business with BVI also has gone up substantially, if you look at. Or somebody may argue, so no, Mrs. Gandhi herself had gone to sign Mauritius Treaty in 1984 to Mauritius. And therefore, look at the Prime Minister's attention was drawn. And therefore, it is important. That, that is all flimsy ground. I don't think that ground can be sufficient for you to say that should not apply. Second, you say the transparent and legal financial ecosystem. I don't agree with this financial uh, ecosystem of Mauritius and uh, the transparent ecosystem would be the only basis for, because BVI is totally transparent. Why only Mauritius? BVI has no tax law for non-resident. Mauritius has ring fencing regulation that you have to opt for and still 3% tax is payable in Mauritius. FATF, I have already explained, it is still not out of FATF, but hopefully next month it will get out of it. And therefore, one can argue that, yes, Mauritius has no FATF uh, in the list of FATF. But the fact that it was notified as FATF country in some part of the, uh, some time or the other is also relevant. So therefore, it is not an uh, atmosphere. One is very conducive. And Mauritius was considered in the negative list even by OECD, even by India. Benefit from favorable tax environment. And that is exactly the reason I'm saying if the tax is the only reason, if you are taking advantage of, GAR comes into picture and under the GAR, main purpose of taking shifting the company from BVI to Mauritius is to take tax advantage, tax benefit, and therefore GAR could apply. The tented element of test that arrangement result into misuse and abuse of provisions of double taxation of wages agreements. And therefore, if this misuse is taking place, possibly income tax department will be able to raise this argument of GAR. And the moment they apply GAR to you, 
treaty benefit can be denied. That is the enshrined in the provisions of Income Tax Act itself. And second thing, it lacks commercial substance. In fact, what is that they are doing? They are holding the entities in India. Why have BVI instead of now? Why have Mauritius? What else is there? What is the commercial substance? In my opinion, they, if the fact patterns are different, if the Mauritius company was doing a global uh, trade, global business, if Mauritius company would have held number of entities abroad, uh, and then you are shifting only for the purpose of bringing all the entities under common hold and transferring it to Mauritius, possibly your commercial substance argument will justify. Here the commercial substance, in my personal opinion, is not in your favor. And therefore, uh, once the GAR is applied, the treaty will get overridden. And that is one danger which you are uh, carrying, uh, uh, which are applied in your particular case. Then the, 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 then the possible contention of the taxpayer, the taxpayer may say that under Rule 10, you are, you 1D, uh, grandfathering is uh, uh, protected by the provisions of Income Tax Act. And therefore, that protection will continue to be applied even to the uh, BBI entities de-read uh, de uh, in BBI. And commercial justification, you can say, a commercial justification, I already said, it will be based on the actual commercial, strong commercial, rational, and Mauritius jurisdiction and the facts which I dis described about saying that, yes, it is holding number of other countries' jurisdiction entities via Mauritius and therefore possibly it should apply from that perspective. So, uh, so, so therefore, the, uh, ideally the answer would be uh, the benefit of uh, the uh, grandfathering should not be available. That would be one issue. Uh, and also the fact that the laws of domiciles require issue of fresh share certificate and cancellation of old certificate. And that is of Mauritius company and not the Indian company shares. The Indian company shares, of course, change of name in Indian company shares also will have to be recorded. And uh, you will have to intimate to the tax authorities that the change of name has taken place. And that tax authorities will come to know automatically because of the provisions of Income Tax Act. So ideally, therefore, these are, these are the matters which needs to be considered. Now, next issue is whether re-domiciles will be regarded as deemed liquidation of the company under the laws of domiciling country or exit tax is levyable. In some cases, some countries levy exit tax if you are shifting your office from one jurisdiction to another country, another jurisdiction. And if suppose such uh, uh, laws of liquidation is considered in that country as, uh, 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 as living exit tax, that country has a right of tax. How can you deny India's right of taxation? And that issue will come up. So, the, but what the, the liquidation is not specifically covered. Somebody may argue that the transfer definition does not include liquidation and therefore uh, possibly uh, it is not a case of a transfer. Uh, and hence uh, the capital gain tax will not apply. However, in absence of the treaty uh, in Mauritius, as our BVI does not have a tax treaty with us. Mauritius has a tax treaty with us. If you look at the definition of capital gain, alienation of share is considered. But since BVI does not have a treaty, I will not be able to go into those arguments. And under the, uh, under the treaty, liquidation is not regarded as alienation. And therefore, you will get out of the treaty provisions in case of the treaty exists. However, the issue will arise in the hands of the US company. And that we will come up little within a few, few minutes. The case study is uh, are small, but the answers are little long. And therefore, I am taking a little longer time. Possibly, my other co-panelist will adjust and accommodate my uh, answering this uh, question more in detail. Unless they feel I should also sum up quickly, I will do that. Because I am a moderator does not mean I should take a maximum possible time. Go ahead, sir. Yes, do you agree? Go ahead, continue, sir. Continue. continue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so the question is, uh, whether redomicilization will be deemed liquidation and the concept of beneficial owner. Now, question is when the dividend is declared by Mauritius company, uh, uh, sorry, or the BVI company or Mauritius company to US company and uh, Indian company is declaring dividend to them, you are applying 5% rate of tax. Tiger Global said 
ultimate beneficial owner is not Mauritius or BVI company, and therefore the concessional rate of tax should not apply because ultimately owner is uh, the beneficial owner is US entity, and therefore this under this treaty you will not be entitled to get a concessional rate of tax. Uh, as I said, Ajadi Bachao helps us. The OECD commentary also helps us uh, to say what OECD commentary says that the term beneficial owner is applied to distinguish from legal ownership and economic ownership. And 2017 commentary states, recipient of a passive income is not the beneficial owner when the recipient's right to use and enjoy the passive income is considered as con by contractual or a legal obligation to pass on the payment received to another entity. Here the facts are silent. It is not a contractual obligation of BVI or Mauritius company to pass on the benefit to US entity. And therefore we shall assume this entity to be a beneficial owner. And hence uh, the, the, the Tiger Global therefore to that extent should not apply in, the, in this particular case. Uh, if you look at the Bombay Tribunal in the case of Golden Bella Holdings, 209 taxman, it says it is. Uh, uh, it says when the assessee company incorporated in laws of Cyprus invested compulsorily convertible debentures in an Indian company and received interest income therefrom uh, for its own exclusive benefit and not on behalf of the entity who has invested in Cyprus, it will be considered as a beneficial owner and therefore liable to treaty benefit. We have international rulings in our favor, reversed car, Canadian Supreme Court, and also we have a number of other decisions. And we have also uh, uh, Chinese circular, one should not lose sight of Chinese circular, circular number 601, which was subsequently enshrined into a different circular, and that also considered these aspects. Now, these are the first, uh, the first variation from this particular case study. The paper writers or the examiner has tried to examine our knowledge by asking additional supplementary questions, saying variation of the fact. Now, look at the fact. US company is owner of BVI company. BVI company is merging into a separate Mauritius company, not merging, sorry. BVI company is re-domiciling into a separate Mauritius company and the third step, two Mauritius company gets merged with each other. And then ultimately Indian company is held by. Effect is US company holding Mauritius company, BVI is eliminated, holding Mauritius company and Mauritius company is holding Indian company. Now question arises is there are two uh, facts which have to be, uh, which are important. So Mauritius company incorporated in Mauritius in 1994, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of BVI company, which is now proposed into another Mauritius company. So Mauritius is preferred jurisdiction as compared to BVI for the reason mentioned earlier. Presume that Mauritius company law permits amalgamation only of the companies incorporated and registered in the jurisdiction of Mauritius. Thus, BVI company is proposed to be migrated from uh, into Ma Mauritius and thereafter, it is merged with another Mauritius company. Question arises, will there be a tax implication as conditions under section 47, 6A are not satisfied? That is 25% of the shareholders of amalgamated company, that is Mauritius company, continues to be the shareholders of amalgamated company, that is BVI company. And the second question is whether BVI, whether the merger of tax neutral BVI, whether merger will be a tax neutral BVI, uh, neutral for BVI, will there be any tax implication in the hands of the US company being a shareholder on the, uh, on the transfer of shares uh, of a BVI company person to amalgamation? And lastly, the transfer, is the transfer exempted in the hands of the shareholders as contemplated under section 476AB? of the Income Tax Act. Now here to answer this question, first of all, let's take 476A, which provides where the, my question is whether any tax implication in the uh, on account of condition under section 476A are satisfied. That is what it says, the country should not levy the capital gain tax, BVI and Mauritius both do not levy capital gain tax. And also it says, 25% of the shareholders of amalgamating company 
should continue to remain the shareholders of amalgamated company. Here, this condition is not getting satisfied because it is a hundred percent subsidiary. Hundred percent subsidiary getting with another hundred percent, all the shares are eliminated, and therefore original share, no doubt, the beneficial owner of the shares being American company continues to be the hundred percent shareholder. But the first, technically and legally, twenty five percent share shares. Are uh, getting transferred. All hundred percent shares get eliminated. We have a decision which says against the taxpayer, which says Credit Suisse uh, International Holding, uh, twenty four taxman to twenty four, advance holding authority. My view on the subject is very interesting. Whenever you look at the advance holding authority decisions, they are all against. And on the similar fact, if you look at the tribunal decisions, all are in your favor. i don't know what why this trend is because the revenue officer appointed in advance ruling authority he guides the supreme court judge who is sitting in advance ruling authority chairman unfortunately is not a tax expert he does not deal with only tax cases and the officer from the cbdt who is appointed as a member of the advance ruling authority he influences him and as a result the decision goes wrong and therefore now the uh, now all the more advance ruling authority is abolished we have now board for advance ruling which consists of only revenue officers the chances of the therefore there is no supreme court judge now the chances of your getting ruling favorable are really you will be very 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 lucky i would take lucky cube if you are if you get a, a ruling in your favor the the, the uh, swiss corp swiss uh, credit swiss decision says uh, says the gain is liable to tax the reasons are they say their conditions are not fulfilled that 75 25% therefore in this case uh, it cannot be postulated that section 47 uh, 68 takes uh, the transaction out of the clutches of section 45 and that would mean 45 would attract and liability to tax arises but then what is the consideration the issue arises what is the consideration look at banka salas decision here advance ruling authority and there they have said in order for the amalgamation also getting taxed in this country you must have consideration paid so what consideration they have received nothing and therefore if the consideration for transfer is not determinable or is not received then dana corporation as well as the banka salas decision of the advance ruling is in favor of taxpayer not liable to tax however after introduction of section 40 ca of the income tax act wherein the consideration received or accruing as a result of transfer by the sec of a capital asset being shares of a company of a company other than quoted shares is less than fair market value of such shares determined under rule 11 uaa the value so determined shall be considered uh, under section 48 as a deemed to be the full value of consideration received and this could lead to number of issues if the uh, amalgamating company has uh, immobile properties it will it will have values different and higher and therefore it could lead to a taxation in the hands of uh, hands of the taxpayer old decisions in the case of uh, bombay high court forbes forbes campbell also uh, says it is not liable to tax uh, it, uh, uh, it is not entitled to be taxed because there is no consideration if you look at the uh, banka salas decision we had an occasion to argue this matter how do you tax this uh, in the hands of uh, a foreign entity which is the shareholder of the amalgamating companies you cannot because if this similar type of structure existed in india would you have taxed this entity would you have transferred uh, underlying entities between each other amalgamation has taken place so the parent holding ultimate holding company you will tax it and therefore under article 25 of the india Italian, italian tax treaty non discrimination provisions will apply and the advance ruling authority said yes advance ruling authority confirmed it saying that non because of non discrimination even the capital gain tax in the hands of the shareholders will not apply in the uh, uh, will not apply and that therefore it will be a tax neutral liable not liable to tax in the hands of the shareholders as well and therefore the answer the under section 47 6ab also in another the, the issue arises is non discrimination if you apply you succeed but if the department applies indirect transfer provisions 
and say therefore it is uh, under the provisions of section 9 we have now indirect transfer and therefore it is liable to tax still you can apply the provisions of india usa tax treaty and we have the decision of andhra pradesh high court in the case of sanofi which says yes it is not the treaty do, does not uh, prescribe indirect transfer and therefore not liable to tax these are the views i could you know be, i already exceeded the time limit substantially so i give a chance to my other panelists to really uh, dwell upon uh, quickly if there are other additional issues they want to take up yogesh sir no yeah no not really uh, on this first case study uh, i would not spend more than one minute now uh, i agree with uh, almost everything that uh, mr oswal has said uh, so far as tech, i mean my my inclination is more towards uh, you know the tax pins decision uh, and therefore based on that there is no transfer uh, 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 mr oswal uh, mentioned that uh, there is a possibility of saying that the old entity is closing down, you know, in redomicialization and the new entity is opening up. But we do have the provisions of the 296 and 300 of the Mauritius Act, which says that no new, no new legal entity will be, uh, will be, you know, will be there and there will be continuity. And therefore, that really supports the view that there is no new entity coming up. Uh, yes, I agree on GAR. So, so long as there are good business reasons, and as Mr. Oswal says, you can improve upon the business reasons, and you can think about, you know, other good business reasons that will improve your case. But otherwise, uh, you know, there is some vulnerability from the GAR point of view, uh, and. Uh, uh, yes, the ultimate shareholder being the U.S. company. Uh, uh, of course, it's there's no back-to-back -back contractual relations, contractual obligation to send the dividend up, but you have to take care of the Bombay High Court decision in ABNL Aditya Billa Nuvo as well, where on peculiar facts, uh, even after considering Azadi Bachao, they had taken a view that Mauritius Treaty benefit will not be available. Uh, and coming on the variation part, uh, I may just supplement a little bit, saying that uh, on that 476A. Uh, when there's when the wholly owned subsidiary is merging with the uh, parent, uh, you can't ask me to issue any shares. You can't ask me to do any impossible thing because no shares can be issued to the shareholders or the transfer or company. Uh, and uh, therefore, on the theory that you can't ask me to do an impossible act, uh, this provision, this condition cannot be made applicable to me. So that's an added argument uh, that you can incorporate. And that is, uh, of course, uh, supported by various decisions. You have London Hotels, classical Bombay High Court decision. You have Dresner Bank, once again, Bombay High Court decision that you cannot ask me to do an impossible thing. And if there is a fear of this sort in practical life, you create a trust and move aside a part of the shares, hold it in trust uh, as uh, as the uh, you know treasury shares and hold it. And then that fear is also met. Uh, well, I think uh, nothing else to say. I fully agree with this, what Mr. Oswal said on both these issues. Uh, Hitesh. Yes, that's only one point. Uh, you know, Oswal said something about extinguishment of any right therein. I, I recall Vanya Silk Mills uh, Private Limited Supreme Court 191 ITR 647, where actually they had explained the expression extinguishment of any right therein. Uh, to be confined to the extinguishment of rights on account of the transfer. And it cannot be therefore extended to mean extinguishment of any right independent or otherwise than on account of the transfer. So I think we can meet that argument that Oswal was trying to say because here there is a extinguishment happening not on account of a transfer but on account of the re-domicialization taking place. That's the limited point I thought I would add. That's correct, it. correct. This is exactly Grace Coley has confirmed what you have said is right. Now let's go to, I think, since we have concluded uh, the first case study, we can take up the second case study on equalization levy. Yogesh Thar will you be able to. Fine. Can, considering that uh, equalization levy and significant economic presence is something which is a dying topic, uh, and considering that Hitesh has a hard stop at one o'clock, uh, can we take up third case study first and then. Yes. We can do that. Okay. But, uh, one minute. The significant economic presence is not a dying subject. 
economic equalization levy is certainly dying <laughs> significant economic presence why because the indian law may not survive uh, once the once the global uh, uh, picture is no, clear no the, i had an occasion to discuss okay. what the authority say unless we have similar provisions under the domestic law to tax we will not be able to uh, somebody will not be able to argue it out uh, under the treaty we have said it in the law itself if you have a treaty the significant economic presence will not apply but if it is a non treaty country we want to tax it that is the reason i said they will create law and will continue but equalization levy certainly what you are saying is correct yes hitesh only one one small differing comment what i have always seen is that ultimately it will all depend on what revenues the india will get from pillar 1 and pillar 2 and my fear or apprehension is that you know it will india will find it a very difficult to remove uh, and, and, and unless there is a unless there is a clear mli 2 which comes through and india is bound to do it and the other problem is that you know if it does it once will it re reintroduce it in some shape or form uh, claiming that it's not got its fair share uh what it was originally set out to do but anyway that's for the future and for another conference uh so let's take up the uh third case study uh this is uh, the one uh, which is quite topical so here we have a situation i'll briefly recall the facts a foreign company is incorporated in uh, dubai uae primarily engaged in trading of electronic items globally including india the foreign company's corporate office is located in uae it also has various foreign branches and representative offices again but not in india to carry out administrative activities now in the month of march of 2021 several employees of this foreign company in dubai visited india to meet their families these employees were stranded in india due to covid related restrictions on international flights now in the wake of second covid wave in india uae regulators had banned india flights beginning from april 2021 and the restrictions were eased out only sometime in mid of july so as a result of these unprecedented restrictions uh, employees had to work from their homes in india and it's important to understand who were the employees first there was a ceo himself who is involved anyway in the management and strategic decision making the entire sales head of that entire company uh, was also stranded in india and he held virtual meetings or negotiations with prospective clients he was authorized to conclude contracts etc there was a sales assistant who was involved in some back end work but no client facing work there was one finance executive and there was a senior accountant <clears throat> now given this fact pattern we have been posed certain questions and i will take them up in seriation so the first issue which comes up is the question has been asked whether the business activities of these employees stranded in india would constitute a place of effective management in india of the uae company now let's recall a uh, place of effective management uh, was a new test of corporate residency which was brought in india from assessment year 1780 and it's a defined term explanation to section 6 subsection 3 defines place of effective management as the place where key management and commercial decisions that are necessary for the conduct of business of an entity as a whole are in substance made so if you will see this definition i see it has three important limbs first of all focus is on key management and commercial decisions and not on routine or any back office activities number two focus is on conduct of the business of the entity as a whole and not merely as one of its units or divisions and third this is important it is a substance based test an application therefore will have to be necessarily done on a case by case basis and therefore the facts of this case as we saw them are important for us to understand further this is again important the central board of direct taxes has issued detailed 
guiding principles which throw light on how place of effective management is to be established and it also provides certain relaxations now the first important point to note is that poem provisions per the guiding principles of the cbdt will not apply to companies that have a turnover or a gross receipt of less than 50 crores so if the foreign company in this example say has turnover or gross receipts of a lower amount then there cannot be any poem at all however assuming that the turnover or gross receipts cross 50 crore threshold then the next step is to examine guiding principles to see if poem is constituted now under the guiding principles the process for determining if poem is constituted will primarily depend on whether the foreign company is quote and quote engaged in active business outside india or not now this determination of whether a company is engaged in active business outside india is quite detailed complex and fact in intensive obviously essentially it depends on whether the company satisfies all the four of the above conditions what are these conditions first passive income should not be more than 50% of total income less than 50% of total assets should be situated in india or less than 50% of total number of employees are situated in india or are resident in india and the payroll expenses incurred on such employees is less than 50% of total payroll expenditure now let's apply these four tests to the current case study so first we saw is passive income test passive income is defined to be interest royalties capital gains rent dividend and more importantly income from transactions where both the purchase and sale of goods is from associated enterprises now we saw in our case study that the foreign companies primarily engaged in trading of electronic items this suggests that its income would generally not come from interest royalties capital gains rents or dividends but obviously we'll need to examine it now it is a trading company so it is possible that it could get caught within the ambit of income from purchase or sale from related parties now again this is not known from the facts of the case but for example if the foreign company is just a sourcing company let's say which buys goods globally and sells to the to the uh, company which then sells to related party distributors in other countries then this condition could get triggered so it is not as if automatically because it's a trading company it will escape from this passive income test so we'll need to check the facts there unfortunately there are no facts in this case which suggest that this is a transaction between associated parties <coughs> assets test here we already know that the foreign company does not have any office in india and even though employees may be stranded in india they are not quote unquote assets whose presence will satisfy the 50% assets test being located in india location of employees test now first of all it's important to understand employees have been stranded for 3 to 4 months while they are stranded in india they may still not be resident in india if they are here only between say march and july of 2021 the condition is also not of residency alone now mind you the words used are also employees situated in india while this is certainly a broader test one can read this to mean that only employees who are here with some degree of permanency should be covered by this even assuming that the residency or the situation in india is satisfied there are only five employees who are stranded in india in our case study now assuming that our foreign company has more than 50 crore turnover it is likely that it possibly would have more than 10 employees if this is the case then the presence of the five employees in india will not be enough to trigger the 50% employee test payroll expense test now this is related to the earlier test but we will have a greater risk of satisfying this particularly since both the ceo and the head of sales are stranded in india now if their salaries are so high 
that they exceed 50% of the total payroll expense, then this may be sufficient to satisfy this test. Now, remember, even if one of the four tests is breached, the foreign company will stop being called an active company. And therefore, as we saw the third and fourth test, that is the number of employees and the payroll expense test are crucial in this regard. Now, let's assume that the foreign company in this case, however, satisfies all the four tests and that none of them is breached, in which case the company qualifies as engaged in active business outside India. Here, OM will depend on the location of the board meeting. The guiding principles of CBDT state that in such cases, OM shall be presumed to be outside India if a majority meetings of the board of directors of the company are held outside India. The mere presence of a CEO in India, therefore, should not result in OM being in India so long as there are other directors who are based outside India and they also hold board meetings outside India. There is also a further qualification that if the board steps aside, quote unquote, and the power of management is actually exercised by some other person resident in India, then the poem can be in India. Now again, this again is a very factual inquiry. And unless the board of the UAE company has effectively abdicated its power to some resident in India, to my mind, this condition will not be satisfied. However, let's take the other case that if let's say one of the four conditions for active company test are breached and if the foreign company does not qualify as an active company, then that determination of poem becomes far more subjective exercise. Again, this will involve two stage process where the first stage would be to identify or ascertain the person or persons who actually make key management and commercial decisions for conduct of the company's business as a whole. And then the second stage would be to determine the place at where these decisions are in fact being made. So while this is subjective, to my mind, poem should not be triggered in India for the foreign company, at least in this case, merely on account of the temporary presence of senior executives stranded in India, in this case, April to July, or let's say maximum four months. The CBDT's guiding principles specifically note that the applicability of poem is not to be seen at a particular moment in time. Rather, activities performed over a period of time are to be seen and to be carefully considered. In other words, a snapshot approach to my mind, the guiding principles are clearly saying should not be applied. So one should not only look at the four month period or that snapshot of period in time where these people are stranded here, but over a period of time, assuming that the employees return to UAE in July and then continue their normal business activities from there, one will have a situation where business is considered to be perhaps managed both from India and UAE. Now, in this case, if let's say it could be, let's say, alleged that business was managed both from India and UAE, in such case, what is relevant is whether it has been managed mainly or predominantly in India. Now, in our case, frankly, where the management from India is at best for four months, let's say even if they work each of those days in managing that business, it still is not sufficient because it's just four months out of the 12 months in a year. And in such a case, this may not be enough to trigger the place of effective management. So I have, I think, comprehensively dealt with the question on place of effective management. But the questions don't stop there. The second question is whether the business activities of those employees who are stranded in India would constitute a business connection in India. Now, <clears throat> the concept of business connection under domestic law is a bit fluid with courts only laid down very broad guidance. And the key decision obviously is that of the Supreme Court in CIT versus R.D. Agarwal 
where the court described business connection in the following words. A business connection in section 42 of the then 1922 Act involves a relation between a business carried on by a non-resident which yields profits or gains or some activity in the taxable territories which contributes directly or indirectly to the earning of those profits or gains. What is also important to notice, the Supreme Court says, it predicates an element of continuity between the business of the non-resident and the activity in the taxable territories. A stray or an isolated transaction is normally not to be regarded as a business connection. This is the guidance from the Supreme Court, which to my mind till today is a landmark judgment on business connection. Now let's apply this to the facts of the case. The fact that foreign company had only, only had some employees in India for part of the year, that too only for four months out of 12 months, could perhaps be potentially used to allege that the element of continuity there uh, is there, but is it really? To my mind, the element of continuity doesn't talk about a finite period of time, but looked at business overall. And then in such a case, this is a element which to my mind, at least in the facts of this case is lacking. However, let me caution you, this is a subjective aspect, which perhaps the revenue could argue uh, that there is a continuity of business so far as at least the full four months are concerned. Another point on business connection is that it shall include any business activity carried out through a person who acting on behalf of the non-resident A, has and habitually exercises in India an authority to conclude contracts on behalf of the non-resident or habitually concludes contracts or habitually plays the principal role leading to the conclusion of contracts by that non-resident and the contracts are in the name of that non-resident or for the transfer of ownership of or for the granting of any right to use property owned by that non-resident or that non-resident's right to use or for the provision of services by the non-resident. Now, again, this definition broadens the business connection risk for the foreign company. Consider that the sales head was indeed sitting in India for the four-month period and possibly concluding contracts on behalf of the foreign company. There, I think, you know, I would draw attention to an old Bombay High Court decision. Abdullah Bhai Abdul Kadar versus CIT 22 ITR 241. Here the court specifically discussed the concept of permanence in the context of an agent creating a business connection. And the court held, in order that the agency which constitutes a connection between a non-resident and the SSE should be a business connection as contemplated by section 42, there must be an element of continuity in the agency. An isolated transaction through an agent or, and this, these words are most important, or even a connection for a short period would not necessarily constitute business connection. This argument can definitely be relied upon by the foreign company to contend that a business connection is indeed not triggered due to the unfortunate stranding of these four or five key employees in India. Next question, existence of P, can the UAE entity qualify as a resident of UAE? Now, this question is not expressly raised, but we will need to look at that and answer it before we proceed to analyze any remaining questions. Now, under India UAE Treaty, company which is incorporated in the UAE and which is managed and controlled wholly in UAE will qualify as a UAE resident for the purpose of the treaty. 
Now, F4 is incorporated in UAE, so the first part of the definition is satisfied. Ordinarily, but for this trending, it would have been also managed and controlled in the UAE. But the question which needs to be answered here is whether the presence of employees in India for these four months vitiates the requirement of the foreign company being managed and controlled wholly in the UAE. Now, again, to my mind, management and control, I would look at the board of directors. If there is a board of directors and the meetings of this board happen in the UAE, including also during this period when the employees were otherwise stranded here in India, one can argue that the presence of the CEO in India for a few months should not result in the residency of the UAE company itself shifting outside the UAE and coming into India for treaty purposes. Now, very interestingly, the OECD has issued guidance in January of 2021, which expressly has clarified that a temporary change in the location of board members or other senior executives is an extraordinary and temporary situation due to COVID-19 pandemic and such change of location should not trigger a change in treaty residence. The OECD guidance notes that even if dual residence is triggered, then the tiebreaker test based on POEM should consider only the usual or the ordinary place of effective management and not only those that pertain to any exceptional period such as the COVID pandemic period. Now again, India, as we know, is not a member of the OECD and perhaps if this guidance is pressed into play, the revenue may say we are not bound by it, but I still believe it is quite persuasive guidance. Let's look at the next question, whether the business activities of the employees stranded in India would constitute a fixed place P. Now we go into the definition and we break up the definition of into fixed place agency, etc. And we'll see and test each condition. Now, in this case, the facts indicated that FCO did not have any office in India and employees who were stranded in any case worked from their homes. So therefore, whether such homes could constitute a fixed place PE under India-UA treaty needs examination. Like most treaties, India-UA treaty also defines fixed place PE as a fixed place of business through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Now again, fourfold test, we have seen this in fixed place PE test for, for, for many, many years now. First, there must be a place of business. Second, the place of business should be at the disposal of the enterprise. This is the power of disposition test. Third, the place of business should be fixed location or permanence test. And fourth, business should be carried on through that fixed place of business, that is business activity test. OECD commentary also deals with the aspect whether a home office can create a P. It notes, whether or not a home office constitutes a location at the disposal of the enterprise will depend on facts and circumstances in each case. Now, in many cases, carrying on of business activities at home of the individual, for example, an employee working from home, will be so intermittent or incidental that home will not be considered to be a location at the disposal of the enterprise. Where, however, and here the OECD commentary cautions, where, however, a home office is used on a continuous basis for carrying on business activities of an enterprise, and it is clear that the enterprise has required that individual to use that location to carry on its own business. Example, it has not provided office to an employee where the nature of the employment clearly needs an office. In such case, home office may be considered to be at the disposal of the enterprise. Now, OECD's guidance in the context of the pandemic clearly states that home office would not create the PE of the employer since, number one, the activity lacks sufficient degree of permanency or that the home office is not at the disposal of the enterprise. 
the employer still provides an office which in the absence of public health measures is available to the employee now in this case as well we can very well surmise that there is a lack of permanency since the presence of the employees was not even for a fixed term of 4 months for example but it only was until the time the flight restrictions were lifted and therefore if that can be demonstrated that the employees were using their homes purely on a temporary basis which with no intention of any permanency whatsoever so considering the above i think the p implications should not arise for a fixed place p for this reason alone also number 2 employer does he have a business interest in the employees working from home again is not satisfied because the foreign company anyway has offices in the uae and those employees who are having to work from india is not to facilitate the business of the employer but on account of them being unfortunately stranded in india employees carry on core business operations from home now in this case yes perhaps the ceo sales head were engaged in core business the sales assistant finance executive senior accountant possibly were all doing non core back office business activity again to my mind home office was is it ad- advertised by any telephone listing business signs or registered as a place of business no even the lack of permanence itself associated with the presence of employees in india this again may not be satisfied in the foreign companies case so based on the above there appears to be a reasonable basis to argue that a temporary presence of stranded employees for a short duration should not at least trigger a fixed place fee let's go to the last uh, last two questions i think one is the service fee again for a service fee to be constituted uae entity must be engaged in furnishing of services including consultancy services through employees or other personnel in the contracting state and for a period of periods aggregating more than 9 months now again clearly there are there are two clear arguments which can be relied upon that no service fee first of all 9 month period was not satisfied it was only 5 months and it does not appear secondly from the facts that any services were being rendered by employees stranded in india to third party for a service fee to arise services have to be provided to third parties and not to the taxpayer itself that is the foreign company itself what about agency fee again india ua treaty provides for an agency fee and it says where a person is acting on behalf of an enterprise and has habitually exercised in the contracting state an authority to conclude contracts on behalf of the enterprise that enterprise shall be deemed to be having a p again the oecd com- commentary mentions that a person for the purpose of the agency p will include both the employees of the enterprise as well as other persons now in this fact pattern we are told that an employee the sales head is in india and he exercised the power and concluded contracts on behalf of the enterprise so let's examine if by that act was agency p requirement satisfied again while there is no express test of permanence or duration when it comes to agency p it is generally accepted that some level of continuity is needed for an agency p to be constituted again drawing reference to january 21 guidelines of oecd it says question may also arise whether the activities of an individual temporarily working from home for a non resident employer could rise to a dependent agent p now here again they say under article 55 of the oecd model activities of a dependent agent such as an employee will create a p if the employee habitually concludes contracts on behalf of the enterprise it is therefore important to evaluate whether such employee is performing this activity of concluding contracts in a habitual manner the agent's activity in a jurisdiction should not be regarded as habitual 
if they have exceptionally begun to work from home in that jurisdiction as a public health measure which is imposed or recommended by at least one of the governments of the jurisdiction involved to prevent the spread of covid-19 virus and therefore it would not constitute a dependent agent p provided the person does not continue those activities after the public health measures cease to apply here also i would refer to the commentary the the authority from oecd which is quoted in the famous book permanent establishment by arvid skar it notes that if intentional permanence is not established the factual duration of the agency will be decisive in our fact pattern there is neither any intentional permanence since this is only due to public health compulsion nor were there any significant factual duration of the presence of other agents in india since this is only for the duration of the flight restrictions and scar also notes that while permanence is relative term a duration of less than 6 months ordinarily will not be sufficient to con constitute an agency p this also is also in line with the decision of the bombay high court abdullah bhai abdul kader as i referred to earlier so to my mind again to again even if the uh, uh, sales had constitute uh, you know concluded some contracts to my mind it should not be sufficient to bring it within the net of agency p now again the presence finally therefore we saw having a holistic view that the presence in of stranded employees in india for temporary period should not constitute either a fixed place p agency p or service p and therefore if no p is constituted if otherwise there is no lasting business connection and if otherwise there is no place of effective management of the uae company in india then there can be no question of taxing profits on the contracts uh, that the foreign company will earn by the employees doing such activities while they are stranded in india i end my presentation sorry thank you hitesh bhai yogesh bhai you won't have comments no absolutely very very exhaustive nothing really much uh hitesh you dealt with the subject very exhaustively literally i also have no comment but except the fact that i would like to draw attention of a supreme court decision in the case of a uh, uh, ramnath and company uh, kerala high court had decided against the taxpayer and supreme court had affirmed that decision and that is helpful here because there the agent was in india rendering services to an indian party for importing goods from a foreign party and then they claimed ato deduction what the, the supreme court said uh, what what the kerala high court says is no doubt services are rendered uh, 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 services are rendered from india but they rendering of services should be but they have to be performed in a foreign soil here is a case this is not a performance here is a case it is purely for a foreign company only this nothing is for performed for an indian party the importer was in their case was the indian party and the exporter was a foreign party so therefore agent was in india and therefore it was denied ato deduction and this fact possibly can come to our help thank you very much for your exhaustively dealing with and we can uh, we can assure you that we have committed to you for leaving you at 1 o'clock which has happened exactly now it is your your choice to continue or not but i leave it to now yogesh thar to deal with the subject third case today <laughs> yeah thank you thank you itesh bhai uh, for uh, your lucid case study uh, really appreciate the same and uh, uh, have a nice uh, weekend uh, with your in-laws uh, thank you so much uh while uh, uh, the to the participants while we on the we are on the top of the hour but we do have one a uh, case study from yogesh thar for equalization levy so if yogesh bhai is okay maybe uh, we uh, continue uh, on this equalization levy yogesh bhai yeah yeah sure we'll uh, we'll deal with it in next 15 minutes my take 10 minutes 
Yeah, 15 minutes. So, so those so. who are interested in equalization levy, please uh, continue. Uh, rest all uh, the participants, thank you so much uh, for this entire study course. Uh, please, please, uh, Yogesh Bhai, continue. Yeah. Thank you. So here the fact pattern which is given in case study two is that you have this UK company, which is uh, somewhat, which is a company which is similar to say Oracle or SCP, <laughs> uh, 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 where, where uh, it is owning uh, an ERP platform. That UK company has given a license, a group license to a manufacturing conglomerate, which is which has uh, which is uh, main office or main company is based in the US, and the US parent has in turn sub licensed this ERP software to various entities of the group all over the world. And what does this ERP platform do? That this ERP platform has various modules such as accounting, finance, logistics, procurement, project management, etc. And the modules are sold as a package under a single license fee. Now, the US company is the central entity of that, of that group. The ERP platform, the twist in the whole thing here is that the ERP platform is interiorly used by the entities for placing order for raw material and finished goods. And the raw material and finished goods procurement process is broadly illustrated as under. The group entities list their products information and stock availability on such ERP platform. Indian company places order, Indian company which is also part of the group of the US company, places order on the ERP platform for purchase of the goods from the group companies. The group company sends an order acceptance to the Indian The UK company and the US company in turn recovers the same for the IT support services and several other IT support that it might be providing services also which are being provided outside India and the payment is also made outside India and the payment for sale of goods is directly made to the group company by the Indian company. So the question, there are two questions over here. One is whether there is any exposure to equalization levy and whether <clears throat> this import of goods would trigger a significant economic presence and would also trigger tax over there. These are the two questions over here. Now, therefore, uh, we know that equalization levy is, is levied at the rate of 2% of the amount of consideration received or receivable by an e-commerce operator. So first of all, there should be an e-commerce operator. That consideration should be received or receivable from uh, e-commerce supply or services. So there has to be e-commerce supply or services. And then those supply or services should, should be to a buyer. That buyer could be of three types. Either that buyer is a resident of India or he's a non-resident who, uh, who is in some specified uh, circumstances in India. And or the third category is the buyer is using an IP address in India. These are the three categories of the buyers. Now, uh, to test this particular proposition. Now, there are two entities that we need to test. The UK Co, which is parallel to your, uh, uh, say, Oracle or TCS, that UK Co itself is subject to e e uh, to equalization live in India. That answer is clearly no, because that UK company is providing, uh, providing a license to the US company. And therefore, the buyer is not neither a resident of India nor is a non-resident under specified circumstances. And specified circumstances is defined to have some nexus with India in the sense that it is collection of data in India and sending it abroad or a sale of advertisement where the Indian viewers can do it. So that is also not there. And thirdly, that buyer is not using any Indian IP address. So therefore, the first part is clearly out. The real question, therefore, is that the payments made by Indian company to its group company, namely the US company, whether that will be subject to the equalization levy or not is something which, which needs consideration. So, as I said, the first condition is whether there is, whether there is an existence of e-commerce operator. 
the e-commerce operator. So if the US company satisfies the definition of e-commerce operator, then the question of equalization levy would come. And let us see what this definition is. E-commerce operator means a non-resident. So answer is yes, US company is a non-resident who owns, operates and manages a digital and electronic facility or platform. So is this, is this entity owning, operating and managing a digital or electronic facility or platform? It is not owning because the owner is that UK company, no doubt. But, but it, has this, it has this platform, the ERP platform, which is probably lying on the server of the US company. And that US company is allowing the access to all the companies of the group in the world. And therefore, can it be said that 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 US company is operating or managing a digital or electronic facility or platform? Answer probably is yes. It may not be operating in the sense that there is there may not be any human intervention to operate, but it is certainly managing that software uh, and allowing the sub licensees to access that software, put in their data, retrieve their data, process their data, and therefore the US company is indeed managing a digital or electronic platform in terms of that ERP platform, which is licensed from the UK company. Then the third question is that operation or management of the digital or electronic facility should be for online sale of goods or online provision of service. The question is, is it for online sale of goods or online uh, services? Now, the case study says that the entire ERP package is a package as a whole, which has several modules and like accounting, finance, logistics, procurement, project management. One of the module enables the sale and purchase of goods by the group companies across the world. And therefore the Indian company purchases goods from the group, group company and makes the payment for that. So question is that when, uh, when, when this facility of buying and selling of goods is only one of the facility which is provided in this package. Can you say that this e-commerce operator is operating this facility for online sale of goods or online provision of service? It is certainly inter alia for online sale of goods or services. It is certainly not exclusively for the online sale of goods or services. So the question is, what do you read in this definition? You, if you read inter alia for, then yes, it is inter alia for that, and therefore it gets covered. Or should I be reading exclusively for, or should I be reading predominantly for? So this is really the question. What do I read into this definition to get an answer to this particular question? To my mind, <clears throat> the answer to this question will be on the first based on the first principles that when there is a contract. How do you interpret what is the con what is this contract all about? The, the that contract has the, the we one has to see the pith and substance of the contract as to whether this contract is for online sale of goods, provision of this facility for online sale of goods, or whether it has in pith and substance it is for something else, and the online sale of goods is only incidental or something which is uh, which is an additional facility which has been given. So this principle that one has to look at the pith and substance, you get from the early decision of the Supreme Court in Associated Hotels, 29 uh, STC 474, which was a case of a well celebrated decision, which was a case of whether in a, in a contract for carrying out work, if there is some sale of goods, whether it is a contract for sale of goods or whether it is a contract for carrying out work. And the Supreme Court said that, no, you have to look at the pith and substance that merely because, uh, uh, you know, uh, merely because in, in, in your contract with a hotel for staying in a room, you are providing some food. It does not amount to sale of food. And therefore, you have to look at the pith and substance, and pith and substance is to provide a service or provide work. So applying that principle, which you find uh, later on also, uh, once again, Supreme Court re, uh, dealt with it in Gennan Dunkerley, 1993, one is uh, Supreme Court cases 364, where they said that you have to again, again reiterate the same principle, but at the same time, towards the end of the decision said that if there is a consideration which is attributable to that specific supply, 
then that will be considered as sale. So here also, once again, the pith and substance of the contract is to provide an ERP package as a whole, which consists of several modules. And this is just one of the module which is incidental to entire facilitating of the accounting and the, uh, 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 man, uh, and the back office operations of the entire organization. And this is only one of the modules and therefore the pith and substance is not, uh, is not to provide a facility for online sale of goods or online sale of service and therefore it cannot. But however, if the consideration has a separate element which is earmarked towards that, then the question of equalization levy would come. Otherwise, in a composite contract, it will not be possible to bifurcate this contract because the pith and substance is not this, is what, the, uh, is what my view on the subject is. So, uh, so, uh, so e-commerce operator definition is also uh, is not satisfied. As I said, that it is not... Uh, it is not a facility for online sale of goods because you have to see whether it is in pith and substance for that or not. Secondly, equalization levy, it uh, says that what it is levied on what? It is levied on consideration from e-commerce supply of service, supply of services. So consideration should be from e-commerce supply of services. Now here, the consideration for online sale of goods is facilitated by the e-commerce operation, but there is no such consideration. It's a composite consideration. And, and it being a composite consideration, we, we are told here that it pays a lump sum, consider, lump sum license fees for the sub-licenses which is recovered. So therefore, in absence of specific consideration also, you are, uh, you know, the, the equalization levy cannot uh, be triggered in this particular case. Uh, and and this is something which is which is of vital importance to every organization where where there is a central agency providing software services or IT support services and indeed the IT support services will have one of its element to enable the purchase and sale of goods through the group companies and therefore uh, this case study really gets gains importance but I do not think that there is any exposure to equalization maybe here. That takes us to the next question. Is there any exposure <clears throat> under the uh, uh, significant economic presence? Uh, the significant economic presence, we have this amendment in section nine. We know that section 911 uh, business connection, there is an explanation clause A, which says that profits which, is, which are attributable to operations carried out in India are only chargeable to tax. Now there is an amendment to that and it, even if the operations are not carried out in India and if there is a business connection on account of, uh, on account of significant economic presence, then also there will be profits attributable to that which will be chargeable to tax in India. So we have this section 911 business connection explanation 2A which has been added, uh, which is in line with uh, BAP, BAP section plan 1. And <clears throat> This is a provision which is applicable in the current financial year 21-22, applicable for assessment year 22-23 onward, subject, of course, to what happens uh, 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 globally, whether they will postpone this by one more year or not, we don't know. But as of today, this is there. There are rules which have been incorporated in the rules, Rule 11 uh, UD, which has been incorporated, and this is a provision which is uh, live and kicking as of today. So question arises as to whether this transaction uh, with this transaction invokes, uh, uh, you know, this particular provision and there is any exposure to tax uh, in the hands of that group company which is selling its goods to India. So a mere sale to India was never considered uh, as a taxable event under Section 9 when the title of the goods passes outside India, uh, as we understand Section 5 and Section 9 so far. However, in, uh, on account of the growth in digital economy. Now, why, this, why does this significant economic presence concept came in, which is explained in the explanatory memorandum, is, is, is indeed on account of the advancement of information and communication technology, new business models operating remotely through digital medium have emerged. This is what the explanatory memorandum says. It also refers to the OECD BEP section plan one. It talks of the significant economic presence on the basis of the factors that have a purpose and sustained interaction with the economy by the aid of technology and other automated tools. 
so this is the purpose which has been set by which has been given by the explanatory memorandum which introduced this provision however the way it is worded it appears to be extremely wide and therefore although equalization levy is least restricted to your uh, uh, your e-commerce operator the way section 911 and the explanation 2a is worded it appears that irrespective of whether the transactions are happening through digital mode or not uh, uh, the the exposure to tax in the hands of a person sitting outside india who is exporting goods to india that will trigger tax in india even if the title in the goods are passing outside india that is the that is the broad uh, uh, interpretation of on a plain reading of explanation 2a If this explanation has two parts part a and part b what is uh, the part b is something which is in line with the explanatory memorandum which uh, which i just read which talks about systematic and continuous continuous soliciting of business activities or engaging in interaction with more than 3 lakh users this 3 lakh users come from new, new rule 11 ud so if that foreign entity is interacting continuously with users in india then there is a significant economic presence in india and that would trigger tax in india if he is because of that he earns any income so that is in line with the with bap section plan 1 and the uh and, and the explanatory memorandum which has introduced this section that there is a significant economic presence even if the activities are not carried out in india however the first part of explanation 2a <laughs> goes much beyond that and it says that significant economic presence shall mean transaction in respect of goods services or property carried out by a non resident with any person in india and the transaction including provision of download of data or software in india so inclusive part if you forget for the timing it is it is only an inclusive part which talks about download or data or software in india but the main portion of the section provision does not talk about anything relating to digital economy it only says transaction in respect of goods services or property carried out by a non resident with any person in india so with any person in india provided of course the aggregate exceeds 2 uh, crore rupees or something like that which is there in rule 11 you see they have a small uh, uh, you know threshold of 2, two crores of rupees so considering this language of this explanation to a it appears that every person who exports goods to india which is in excess of 2 crores of rupees has an exposure to tax in india in so far as this uh, this turnover uh, the the purchase of goods in india is concerned now is that the real intention uh, if this this certainly does not appear to be the real intention because it's neither it is neither from web section plan 1 nor it is coming out uh, in the explanatory memorandum and this clause a of this explanation to a to my mind goes beyond the purpose for which it is really enacted but the language of the section being plain and clear should i look at the purposive interpretation or uh, uh, or i am not permitted because the language is very clear any transaction in respect of goods or services or property carried out with so the concept of person doing business in india has been given a go by a person doing business with india would also be chargeable to tax irrespective of whether who is doing business in india or not so so far as the digital economy is concerned we have a base we have we have an understanding of that right from web section plan 1 we know about that that and that is something which is acceptable and globally recognized however in a brick and mortar economy Uh, where we are not really concerned with digital economy as well if this particular provision is invoked then i think it goes much much beyond the purpose for which it is enacted uh, if one looks at the uh, if one looks at the commentary of uh, pa mr palkhiwala uh, of uh, of uh, mr data in palkhiwala then one uh, then he has taken a view over there that one has to look at the purposive interpretation and uh, if one looks at the purpose then this also should be restricted to digital economy and not beyond the GDP, digital economy so this was the point but as of today to my mind this is a gray area and uh, certainly i would uh, 
request Mr. Oswal to uh, give his viewpoint on this. Uh, 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 and, and that was the purpose of this particular case study, that there seems to be on a literal interpretation or literal reading, there seems to be an exposure. The question arises as to how do I allocate? Now, unfortunately, the, the provision do not talk about rules to be brought into, uh, uh, you know, to be brought for the purpose of allocation. So allocation is something which will have to be left uh, open uh, uh, by way of general principles or arms length principles or whatever principles the assessing officer may deem fit or just look at the rule 10, the present rule 10, which is there and allocate on that basis. So, but, uh, but then that's a problem of allocation but before that the bigger problem is that that there seems to be an exposure and if there is an exposure uh, today today uh, uh, today all remittances are being allowed for for you know import of goods because here's rule 37 da which talks about uh, one of the items being import of goods so that that has been allowed by the banks and there is no no nobody is uh, you know checking whether there is uh, any tax in india or not uh, that is because of the rule which is there but can the rule uh, override the act is a big, is a larger question. Uh, you know, uh, the, and if the rule the rule cannot override the act, and if there is a liability under the act, then uh, is there any exposure for non-deduction of tax? Is something which is which is a big great question as of today. Uh, uh, I will leave it at that, uh, and let's see if uh, Mr. Oswal what view he has, and there's some debate on this. Thank you, Yogesh. Extremely, extremely good explanation you have done it. I would like to add only a few things that if the treaty applies, possibly these domestic provisions will not apply. I, Therefore, I agree. In, in this particular case, UK and UAE both, USA both have got a treaty with us and therefore these provisions will not apply. Secondly, secondly the most important thing which uh, uh, is uh, relevant is uh, what the government and the, the G20 and the inclusive framework group of 125, 135 countries agreed that this should apply to 100 companies of USA, the main 100 first companies, uh, top 100 companies of USA. And therefore, uh, it will not apply generally to all other than the treaty countries. But now if this is uh, the business is from non-treaty country with India, possibly these provisions will, uh, will attract. And that is more dangerous issue. And therefore, if payment is going to a non-treaty country, then issue is irrelevant, what you have just now rightly explained. And hence, uh, if you look at, and you rightly explained further, saying that the whole intention was to cover the digital transactions, digital business under the net because it was escaping the tax totally. But now what happened, instead of taxing the digital business, the whole business, whether digital or conventional business, everything gets taxed under these new rules. And therefore, the source rule, which was hitherto applied for commerce, business, international trade and commerce, which was applicable for a particular in a particular manner, which was not covering digital, digital tra transactions. Now that source and residence rule has undergone a change. And that is going to create big hiccups. And OECD G20 is talking is possibly by October 21, they will come out with the uh, a draft uh, report, which will be finalized eventually by taking the stakeholders views by January 22, and they will implement it from 23. I have my own doubts whether this will be immediately acceptable, because though India is part of India has concur concurred that this US rule and G20, because India is calculating how much gain they are going to have. Our uh, uh, member who happens to be the now UN member as well as OECD member. He will have genuine difficulties in taking one view in OECD and contrary view in the United Nation. And therefore, let us see how it develops in the future. I thank you very much for your excellent, excellent explanation. And I, I now give it to the uh, organizers because we have already exceeded the time. We have dealt with all the three case studies uh, in, a, in an exhaustive manner. And uh, time, of course, was uh, beyond our uh, ability. We exceeded the time, no doubt, but we did our job. Thank you very much. Uh, to over to organizers. So um, Rakesh had to move out for some another commitment. Uh, so uh, allow me to uh, give a vote of thanks. Uh, 
so on this teachers day thank you uh, tp oswal sir and yogesh sir to you know enlighten us with a divergent topic of uh, redomicilization omp equalization levy scp uh, it was our pleasure to hear from you uh, again uh, thank you participants for uh, being uh, patient uh, listeners and thank you once again to the panelist to drawing light on this thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.